be AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is half past seven. It's Tuesday morning, the 10th of August. You're very welcome along. It's Owen and Jar with you all the way through until 10 a.m. As ever, we want to hear from you. You can text the show 087 180 180. You can use WhatsApp for that if you want. Uh, of course, you can always leave a comment in the YouTube stream or you can tweet the show directly at Off The Ball AM. We've got plenty to get our teeth stuck into. We're going to hear from Eamon Dunphy a little bit later on about what Roy Keane's legacy at 50 is. Uh, we're asking you this morning for his greatest performance. Was it the Cadbury's Roadshow that we did a couple of years ago that essentially, I think, helped to kickstart his broadcasting career? Uh, that one, or was it uh, Manchester United in Turin in the Champions League semi-final second leg was it uh, the kind of underrated but so underrated it's become overrated game against Portugal which was ah the connoisseurs tell you that it's better than the game against the Dutch or is it the Dutch game I I, I can't see how the Portugal game beats the Dutch game because you know that Holland team is festooned with Champions League winners and uh, world class players not that the, the Portuguese team wasn't but we win the game from 10 men uh, with him in. and I don't know for me that's the answer to that one but I don't know you can have your own view Owen I'm sure you have some views on this um, and I'm not even sure that that's the, the thing we should be starting with this morning because there are some little filtering news from the Spanish accounts that are uh, ITK in the know suggesting that Barcelona are desperately trying to somehow wrangle some loophole that might allow them to hold on to Leo Messi yeah if you're looking for hope this morning then La Portiera La Porteria, my apologies, on Twitter, will have given you some sort of hope. Hope after the fact, hope after the death that uh, a zombified version of this Lionel Messi deal with Barcelona may actually happen. It would be absolutely extraordinary. It would be hilarious from the perspective of all those Paris Saint-Germain fans who went to the airport yesterday to wait for Lionel Messi's arrival when Lionel Messi was actually just going to Luis Suarez's house to, I don't know, to, to, to catch up or something. Uh, the expectation was that today he will be flying into Paris to complete his move. But as I said, La Porteria on Twitter said at Barca are to make one last proposal to Leo Messi. The Argentine and the club negotiate in the morning, and that's this morning, an offer that arrives after the farewell. As you can tell, this is true Google Translate. Barca's option is not completely closed. Ferran Reverterer, the CEO of the club, is going to be the intermediary in the discussion. To, uh, it's usually Joan Laporta that we hear, that we hear about but uh, Reverter, the CEO, is going to be involved in this one. I don't know how this is going to be structured. I see Graham Hunter quote-tweeting it, saying it's a good source and that uh, the journalist in question usually has his facts correct. Right. But I don't know how this happens. Is it a situation where Messi is essentially playing for free for a few years and then gets his money in a couple of years' time when they eventually manage to clear the decks? Like, as we all know at this point, that in itself is not possible. They will need to clear more deadwood on top of all yeah. that. And Messi needs to play for free. And he needs to be able to legally take all his money back in a few years' time. Because Lionel Messi is not going to play for free. He will play for money. But I'm sure he might be open to the idea of him making those earnings in a few years' time. There might be tax loopholes as well in all of this when it comes to those sort of structures. And we all know that, yeah. that Messi obviously has had his troubles on that front over the last little while. It might actually just be simpler for him to go to Paris at this point. He's already had his tearful press conference. He's already said goodbye to the club. It would be weird were this to actually do, to be a big U-turn. But those are the reports this morning that Barca are ready to make one last-ditch effort to keep Messi at the club. Uh, if you were involved in the club, you would want this story out there and you would be saying you're yeah. doing this. That's the first thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is if they can make it happen, you know, uh, how... Uh, how messianic would the return of Messi be to Barcelona for a second time? You know, they thought he was gone once and then they got him back and then they thought he was gone again and they got him back again. But like from the, the power base of European football and for the whole thing not to tip over into some weird comic book situation where you have Messi, Mbappe and Neymar playing in Paris next season, maybe UEFA are in the background somehow lobbying for this not to happen, that he doesn't go to Paris Saint-Germain? What do you think? And like I, th I think that you're dead right in what you're saying about whose interest is this serving to have this story out there. And I, I definitely think Barcelona will be trying to save a little bit of face and trying to put the blame on somebody else for the failings of the club and the failings that are imminent. Because right now, even though it will be... Well, no, right, right now, they've, they've, everybody's knowledge is that 
Barcelona have screwed up so badly over the last few years, and this is why Lionel Messi is in this position. I think people have seen through this uh, Barcelona versus La Liga situation, and the reality is that Barcelona screwed up, and, and it's their fault. A story like this would maybe be an effort for them to, to try and shift that perception a little bit so that they could actually say, well, you know, we tried and yeah. Messi rejected us. So I think absolutely you could be right on that front. Yeah, so look, we, we, we will wait and see exactly what happens. The, uh, the the English Daily Star, which is obviously different from the Irish Star, is reporting that Manchester United are putting together a last gas bid because uh, Manchester United, Messi and headlines equals clicks. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't expect that to happen at all, but you would be surprised if those other clubs have not tried to bust the bank to get Messi. I mean, from... Chelsea's perspective, is it a bit strange that they've decided to spend their 100 million on Lukaku instead of maybe maybe they weren't an option? But I thought Abramovich was supposed to be, you know, enthralled to Leo Messi and this was his opportunity to get him. I thought that perhaps whatever amount of money Leo Messi is getting at Paris Saint Germain, there are a few other clubs who, it turns out, have the same amount of cash. Yeah. And. It's strange that it's actually been so straightforward for Paris Saint-Germain mm. to, to make this happen, that there hasn't been much of a, much of a battle. And the, the, the thought is that maybe someone like Neymar could be influential in, in what he's saying and in the conversations he's having with Messi. But should Pep Guardiola not also have similar influence if he wants it? Pep was quite quick out over the weekend to say that they weren't going to sign Lionel Messi. Maybe there is a situation at Manchester City, and we know that they, they make long-term plans at that club. They sign players ahead of schedule. They sign players before a position comes up generally, and that player works themselves into the squad. They've got a very well-thought-out transfer strategy. Maybe signing Lionel Messi at this age and kind of out of the blue, uh, as, it, as it would be, just doesn't fit with that. Yeah. I mean, if, you're, if your rule structure is so amazingly strict that it can't find room for Leo Messi when he suddenly pops up Mm. out of nowhere with no transfer fee your structure is a bit broken I think and shouldn't Manchester City have also had a plan last year for the, the, the situation where Messi wouldn't re-sign at Barcelona because this has been coming down the tracks for quite exactly. some time now just to, to keep you up to speed on what's happening Ole another one of these uh, Spanish publications are saying that Barcelona made one last move the famous drowning slap after the incredible scandal but it was too late there was an informal proposal to see if this generated situation could be reversed which Messi did not want, but already it was. Everything is on track for Leo to travel in the next few hours, except for a catastrophe. So uh, they are reporting that Messi to Paris Saint-Germain will be happening today. Right, OK. So we'll obviously keep a close eye on that across the day. On all of the OTB channels, you can uh, get us on YouTube, you can get us on Facebook, you can get us on uh, Twitter, at Off The Ball is the, the main Twitter account as well. Uh, the other thing that we need to talk about is that yesterday we expected that the All-Ireland Football semi-final between Tyrone and Kerry would be pushed back. Tyrone had actually asked for a two-week delay to the game to give themselves the opportunity to get everybody out of... Um, quarantine, uh, self-isolation, all the kind of stuff that you need to do uh, when people have had COVID. They were given a week and a new schedule was put out, a new uh, All-Ireland Football final date for Sunday in September was put out and uh, for Saturday in September. Is it Saturday evening? Isn't that because yeah. it's going to clash with the Azerbaijan game? And uh, now Tyrone, it emerges they're unhappy with that. They feel like they actually need the full two weeks and the, the quotes are very strong from their chairman today saying... Now, this is about player welfare and it's clear that our players will not be ready to engage in a high-intensity championship game so soon after being directly affected by this virus. The welfare of the players is paramount. The management will not be making a decision until this weekend on whether we will be capable of fulfilling the fixture. So this is their uh, Tyrone County Chairman, Michael Kerr, and these quotes are carried in the Irish Times and they're carried elsewhere this morning as well. While we appreciate the postponement, which now allows us to be able to field the team, our request to have the match put back until the following weekend would have allowed us to be able to field a team that would be properly prepared and be in a position to do itself justice in an All-Ireland semi-final. It's a really difficult scenario that everybody finds themselves in and I don't really know what the answer to this one is. I'd, I'd, I feel like uh, Toronto are doing everything they can. Croke Park are trying to be as flexible as they can. Would it have killed them to push it back another week? I'm not sure. Is it possible? Is it fair? Is it not fair? I don't know. Like it's, it does seem that the, they've made a decision yesterday that it would go to this date now on Saturday week, and that's sort of that. And it, it does seem that if Tyrone had made it explicitly clear that that too would be too soon for them, then it's gone ignored by the GEA, or that they've decided actually, you know, we're not going to grant that. We'll grant you some leeway, but but not the two weeks. So 
you do have a bit of sympathy for Tyrone in this, for sure, uh, given that it's completely out of their control and things have gone from bad to worse in their own camp. From the GEA side of things, they might be looking at this uh, saying that they made a big deal about finishing this championship in August and finishing this championship early and getting the club scene up and running. Maybe if they feel that they're pushing things back, that flies in the face of that. But I guess the counterpoint of that is that there's only four counties left. You can still have... Um, yeah, everybody else can start. Yeah, and I'm sure and things have been starting elsewhere for the last month or so. So, like, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a very, very hard one. I don't think anybody benefits from this. Uh, I, like, I, I don't think that Kerry or Tyrone obviously don't benefit from this. I don't think whoever comes through the other semi-final benefits from this either. So there is no winner in this, and there's, there's no situation that, that anybody's going to gain anything in an untoward manner. Yeah, the only thing that you could do is, is make the announcement now and say, we're pushing everything back so everybody knows. And, and do you push back the other semi-final a week and say, right, so you guys have an extra week, everybody has an extra week, and this is love and death in the time of COVID. We understand that these are remarkable circumstances and we will facilitate as much as we can the uh, club campaign. It's the, the, it's the balance of finishing the season on time to allow the club campaign to, to get going in those counties that are left. But... Mm. I guess the, the Dublin Mayo probably wouldn't necessarily go for that, considering they'll get 24,000 fans into Croke Park this weekend. Where do you then play that game the following weekend? Because uh, the All-Ireland Hurling final is on the Sunday, Kerry versus Tyrone is on the Saturday. Maybe you do a doubleheader with two semi-finals, but um, with only 24,000 people in, there's already been a bit of consternation about tickets allocation and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, if there's going to be 40, is it 40 for the for Hurling final? And for the football final, yeah. Right, so could you just do 40 on the Saturday as well? Well, there, there you go. I mean, that, that would make scientific sense, wouldn't it? I mean, they're, they're on the same weekend. No, no, no one change. Gonna... <laughs> Better air quality on the Sunday than the Saturday that allows us to go from 24 to 40. May, like, maybe that's it, uh, considering they're going to do it, and it'll just be one extra 40,000 event. But, like, again, maybe Mayo and Dublin would actually take their, their weekend this weekend and, and know that they have planned for this specific event, and this, the final can worry about itself if they have an extra week or two weeks to, to prep for a final, then, then so be it. I think that might be their better situation than this one. Like Dublin, maybe, they're, they're looking at the injuries that they've had all season and, and they're like, we could do it in an extra couple of weeks. Maybe maybe they would go for it. And who knows, where is Killian O'Connor likely to come back if, if this gets pushed all the way back into the middle of September? I mean, it would need, I think it needs to be know. next February for Killian O'Connor sure. to come back. It's yeah. an Achilles injury. Yeah. Yeah, it was, like, I mean, the, these people are, are extraordinary athletes. We've seen incredible comebacks, but no, that's, that's not going to happen. Like the, the one thing is that Tyrone will, will have extra fitness if there, if any of those players were able to train in, in that forward line that has been hampered by injury over the last little while and that might benefit them a, a little bit but as I say it's, it's very hard to kind of point to who, who benefits and who doesn't Yeah and so that as a result of that I think um, Tyrone are pointing out that they didn't ask for a postponement because I think it wouldn't have been granted anyway um, in the game against Monaghan they played and uh, and they came through that and they're saying look we have played when we could play now we can't play we need a postponement and the extra week would give them the opportunity to get everybody back and fully fit and there's a possibility that they might not fulfil that fixture yeah like that that is it's certainly been reported this morning that they just won't have a team that, that's able to go and they've always said that if it comes to an All-Ireland semi-final or a final then there, there will be exceptional circumstances granted and I don't know. I, I, I think. So that let me let me let me just posit this to you, right? Right. So, uh, Kerry waltz through Munster, and then get a buy. Get a buy, and then play Mayo, who've beaten Dublin, who who in the semi final. Would that constitute a handy All Ireland, Owen? Even for you, would that constitute a handy All Ireland? Uh, yeah, it, it would. Not playing not playing in an All Ireland semi final. <laughs> like absolutely. Right. It is uh, seven forty four this morning. Let's, let's get about our business. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock this morning. We've got the power rankings. Um, this is going to be good. The power rankings is 7.45. Sports page is 5 past 8. The football pod. Uh, it turns out the dubs did hate Mayo. We've got, finally, we've got some evidence and proof and we're going to bring it to you at half past 8 this morning. Sports news at 8.40 with John Duggan. Colette Dormer, the Kilkenny Camogie player, is going to join us at 8.50. Eamon Dunphy is going to join us at 5 past 9 talking about Roy Keane at 50 and we have more reaction from Brian O'Driscoll talking about the Lions at half past nine. So if you've got anything you want to get off your chest this morning, feel free to do so. You can uh, add us specifically on Twitter if you want. Uh, we know where the mute button is, don't worry. And of course, you can always get us um, on 0879-180-180. But it is now actually time for the power rankings. Some of these critics, these pundits. I absolutely adored him, lads. 
I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. I'm not even sure where we left these. These were, this was it's done been a so, while. So long ago. I think you didn't do them while. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Did you bottle it? Is that what happened? Did I bottle it? Were you just waiting? Oh, but I, I can't remember. You haven't done it in months. Oh, yeah, I haven't actually done it once since you were away, actually. So I just want to bring everybody to. Uh, in, we have a WhatsApp group where we plan what's coming up next. And uh, Owen's like, oh, I was just chatting to Mossy Quinn about the power rankings there. Uh, this is at Croker the last time. And Owen, blissfully unaware, because he's at the game that the RTE cameras have picked up Mossy Quinn in the crowd talking to somebody, laughing, <laughs> but they've they've blocked Owen. They wouldn't even acknowledge that what was going on was lobbying on behalf of the dubs to come down, take a little bit of pressure off them. They cut Owen, the, the, or obviously the powers that be had seen the, the footage and was like, oh, you can't be promoting off the balls, Owen Sheehan, because we know what they're talking about. The only thing that anybody talks to Owen about in Croke Park when he's there is the power rankings. He loves that, by the way. It's uh, he, he, he will perhaps kind of sneer and snarl at you if you give him any advice about it, but actually, deep down, it's his favourite thing in the world. It's true, yeah. It, it is true. I, I kind of went to Croke Park wearing a disguise that day, hoping not to be picked up, but uh, obviously some, some Kerry Dublin... Uh, like some I, I don't know what you would call it. Nice, nice politicking, maybe, was going on. But uh, we, we do have a change in the, the top of the power rankings. Like, we'll, we'll get straight to the... We'll cut straight to the chase here. Kerry are the number one team in the power rankings for the first time. Since hey! Well, you didn't... No build-up. No build-up. Oh, my God. No, no build-up. Like, hey, hey. no, no build let, let, let's just jump straight into the, to the deep end here. Um, I, <laughs> Someone needs to teach you a little bit of finesse, kid. <laughs> OK, let's, uh, let's, let's pull out and go again. Uh, our, our man at number eight... Uh, Galway at 7, Monaghan at 6, Donegal at 5, Tyrone at 4, Mayo at 3, Dublin at 2, Kerry at 1. But did anybody expect anything different other than the change at the top? Like, we got, we'd done all these and we'd got to the provincial finals and Dublin were continuing to win, but win in a narrow margin. Mayo were continuing to win and then they won the Connacht final in a narrow margin. Tyrone did the same thing to Monaghan. So there was never going to be enough of a, a boost for any of those teams, I thought. And then Kerry kind of swatted Cork aside in, in, in unignorable fashion. So that, that is why they're, they're in at number one. It doesn't mean that they're going to win the All-Ireland, but I think that if we're being true to these rankings and uh, overreacting to certain moments in the season, which we have always done in these power rankings, I have overreacted massively. I think Cavan and uh, uh, Tipperary have both been top five counties uh, in the last 12 months. Ah, look, then, you know, then, they, were, they were in the All-Ireland semi-final last year. Exactly. So then I think uh, we have to overreact. Uh, and maybe it's not an overreaction to Kerry and what they've done this year because it's been close to... Um, it's as close to a perfect season as, as they possibly could have hoped for at this point. It's, it's, it's not always that to do a really good league and a really good Munster Championship. There's usually a bit of playing it down a little bit along the way or an off day here or there. And other than that first half against Dublin and Thurlis, which does give real cause for concern considering it's Dublin, uh, I don't think you can point to too many moments where you're like, they were under massive pressure. And um, 15 minutes into the Munster final, what would the power record in your head? Oh, Kerry were dropping down. I was, I was just my like whole sixth, life. Maybe my whole life is flashing before my eyes at, at that point. Um, and like the, the same thing could happen in in either. Hopefully, they, hopefully they have two games to finish. Isn't that important though? Isn't it important that actually they've had a little bit of a blip in a game or a slow start and they've thought their way through it and they've been able to come because that's the hallmark of a good team and it's the hallmark of a side who isn't in any way actually concerned about the scenario that they face, that they stick to their principles, they have that game plan that we've been talking about in hurling with James Gale or or Kelly Harrington at the weekend. You know, the, the first minute and a half, two minutes don't go exactly as planned, but you're using that to gather information and then afterwards you're unleashing that information in a devastating fashion. It's the type of thing that we would have seen, for example, didn't the Dubs go 5-1 down against Tyrone in, in the all Ireland final? Was that, was that what the, the situation in that one was? 18, yeah. and, and nobody was in any way, it was like, oh, this is interesting. Could Tyrone keep, no, they can't. Obviously they couldn't keep it up because, and I'm not saying that this Kerry team are that Dublin team just yet, No. but there's brain power, there's game intelligence, there's a clear plan, there's structures, there's, I think multiple ways of playing. I think that if they need to be super defensive, the side that they were trying to build last season is still there with, within them if they need it to be. And they'll probably pull that out if, if it is going to be a Kerry Dublin final this year uh, at some point in that game because 
to go back to Thurles, they they get opened up, and that is the, the real moment of concern. The, the, like the Cork situation in the moment was obviously quite concerning because you don't know what's going to happen next. But in hindsight, when you actually watch the game back and maybe look at the way Kerry handled that early setback, I don't think there was any real panic. I don't think it was any real moment of, of concern. I don't, I don't think you can actually say that, whereas the situation in Thurles probably was because there was like I, every game against Dublin is really important if you're going to try and take them down. Uh, like I, I do think when you talk about that Dublin team of, of 18, of course, there's no, no team in the country, I would say, at the moment who are close to that level just yet. But I do think that that is the benchmark for everyone, and I think Kerry have used that as the benchmark. And I think, in a way, what we're seeing from Kerry now is a reaction to Dublin. And it's been a reaction to... You can go all the way back to 2013. It's been a reaction to 2015, when in 2013 they got out-fitnessed, in 2015 they got out-tacticed. Uh, and everything since then has been an effort to try and get to Dublin's level. But for a lot of those years, they were in transition and they just didn't have the players. Whereas come 2019, it felt, OK, now they have the players and now they maybe have the game plan to actually win the All-Ireland. It turned out that that wasn't the case. The game plan still needed a lot of tweaking and last year was a complete aberration. I, I but they've come back this year, sorry, in just like unbelievable shape physically. Like, and, uh, and they still have the players and maybe they have the game plan to win the All-Ireland and, and maybe they have the mentality. It just feels that Dublin created a beast and Kerry realised, right, we have to try and create a beast as well. Yeah, I think uh, the greatness of the Dublin team is not in that they've been so far ahead of all of their rivals all the time. It's that they've been able to win tight games or to draw matches where they could potentially have lost those games. And that's what happened in, it seems, in 2019 in retrospect. And I think hopefully at some point in the next couple of years and potentially this year, we're going to see a Kerry win, which will actually retrospectively frank the Dublin team's greatness even more. That. Like I kind of made this case before about the if if Mayo had won in All Ireland at some point in the last decade, we will be talking about we will be banging on even more about how great that Dublin team was. In a way, Kilkenny losing the five in a row and coming back to win again after that with a very similar team makes us even more happy to talk about the greatness of the individual players that that Kilkenny team had. And I think we've probably taken for granted how great some of those Dublin players were in a way because they won those matches and we're like oh that's all part of the same thing but they weren't like each, each of those All-Ireland finals and all, each of those All-Ireland campaigns are different campaigns with slightly different uh, requisites and when you're talking about the benchmark for Kerry being that uh, was it 17 was the team that you used yeah. so 17, 18 it's also, it's also the benchmark for this Dublin team and I think you're right to take Dublin off that number one spot right now because what we've seen is that I, I, I mean, I think they're bored and I don't think they're going to be bored by Mayo and I, I do expect a better performance, but we haven't seen it yet this year. Mm. And when you're power ranking, it's like, who's going to win the game today on the basis of what you think today, right? That doesn't mean that Kerry are suddenly a better team than Dublin, but if Kerry played Dublin today, I'd be tipping Kerry slightly. Slightly. And I, I think the, the bookmakers have, have reflected that as well. They have been favourites since the Cork game. I think after that Cork game, they, they moved to, to favourites. And you can kind of see why. Like, and, and again, it's not necessarily saying that, if, that they're definitely going to win the All-Ireland because I don't, I don't think that's the case. Because there, there's just one bit that, that, um, that, that we're still guessing, and, and that is getting over the line. And, and we've seen it with that great Mayo team that they just didn't have that bit of getting over the line. And they had all the other ingredients. They had great conditioning, they had great players, great coaching, and... They just didn't have that final bid. And, and you, you can't guess that final bid. You just don't know what's going to happen until a team actually does it. And I don't know, may, maybe last year is, is an indicator that maybe Kerry still have to work on that. And, and maybe the same thing has to go for not getting over the line in the drawn game in, in 19. But it does seem that there's something different about Kerry this year in, in how they've ruthlessly put aside a, a couple of, of good teams that they've come up against. So the guess is that they do have it in the locker to get over the line and they do have it in them to beat Dublin. Now, there are two reasons why... I'd be a little bit concerned, just in general. The first one is that there is pressure on this season as a result of what I just said, that you are now making a case that this is the best team in the country. If Mayo had Killeen O'Connor, I think there'll be a lot of people maybe tipping them this weekend. And I think when it comes to Kerry and Mayo, there, there is a pressure on that situation that if, if Dublin are on, if Dublin are bored and they're not going to actually get to their level at some point this year, then there is a pressure on the chasing pack to actually capitalise on that. And then second of all, there is the point that you just made a moment ago about the sting in the tail of Kilkenny. This Dublin team, if they lose in All-Ireland, 
they will come back and they could win a few more. So if you don't take the opportunity to actually beat them and they're vulnerable this year, who knows what the X in a row will actually get to. So I think this year is, is so, so important. And that is your one concern. Does that feed into a negative type of pressure? For who? For Kerry and Mayo. Right. For the chasing pack. Well, I, I mean, it shouldn't, right? Like, I, I get the point you're making. There's a there's a narrow never feel off this because who knows what yeah. reconstituted team will come out next year. You know, who knows what the ceiling for Paddy Small is? Who knows if Bowler gets back in the team? Who knows if any of the lads who are taking some time off come back for a late career two or three in a row? Uh, just to add in some extra time. Who knows, right? And, like, Fenton, Kilkenny, Costello, still young men, right? Uh, but they've all looked human this year in, in at various stages. So, and, and James McCarthy's obviously not getting any younger. It has a, it has a bit of a bang of, of now and ever for me. And I, I think that that should be the type of thing that like galvanises a young side like this Kerry team. It's not like it's a Kerry team who are festooned with all Ireland winners. There's some there who know what it's like. How many of them? Two, three, four? About four, I think. I I'm not sure off the top of my head. So there are some of them there who are kind of like, oh, this is last chance to loom for us. But the rest of them are like, this is our day, this is our moment, this is the, you know, all those, all those stuff that retrospectively teams go, oh, yeah, we really felt that this was, uh, it was going to be our moment. And with Gaelic like, football, really needs Kerry and Mayo to be at the same level as Dublin because who knows what new structure we're going to have next year? There's a strong possibility that everybody goes, oh, we like the league, it's really good football. If we make it condense it and make it a little bit later in the year and, and keep a fairly similar championship structure there's a good chance that this is this is what the future is I don't, I don't know like I, I, there's, there's still an, op- an opportunity for the status quo to remain and you wouldn't you wouldn't bank against that so uh, I don't know for me I think it's a brave moment for you Owen I realise that you'll never be welcome home again because you've made Kerry number one in the power rankings yeah it's it's true I've, I've been warned against this moment but uh uh, I've uh, I've made enough nonsense arguments based on form in the past that I just have to go with form on, on this level. Do, like on that point that you make there, uh, is the best thing. And again, this this will be something that uh, will will certainly uh, lead me to be disowned even further. Is the best thing for the championship in general and for intercounty football that Mayo actually win the All Ireland this year, because what you have then is a Dublin team who are obviously one of the greatest of all time and, and, and still are, and a Kerry team who have some of the best young talent of all time, then chasing the All-Ireland champions who would be Mayo next year. You'd almost have like a Three Kings scenario where you're... With Killian O'Connor to come back. With Killian O'Connor to come back. Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be the best thing that could possibly happen to Gaelic football as a sport for neutrals if Mayo won. Now, it would ruin all that uh, Mayo crying narratives and all the memes and, you know, not And they great. would be unbelievably insufferable, let's not forget. But, I mean, I mean, would, it would not be great. Yeah, but, but you know. who wouldn't be after such a long period of time? But for football, I think it might actually be the, the best outcome. Uh, if we were previewing next year, I think there would be a lot of... I, it may, maybe maybe we'd be tapping too much into the history of Mayo, but it just feels that they were always a county that, that can be beaten by anybody. Like we saw, even go back to Newbridge and Oware, that was an excellent Mayo team who, who were knocked off by Kildare. If that was the All-Ireland champions with a target on their back, I think that could make next year with a new potential format unbelievably exciting. But um, I'm sure there's a, a lot of people who, who just don't want to see that happen. And like Dublin will be doing it. Like I, I would still be tipping Dublin this weekend, and maybe this is Tyrone in 17 again, where it's a semi-final that we're building up to as, as some sort of massive moment for, for this Dubs team and it just doesn't happen because they're so much better and they actually, the, the real top quality Dubs are still in there somewhere and maybe, we, and maybe we see that this weekend but there is definitely a growing sense that Mayo could do something special. Doesn't all of the things that have gone wrong for Dublin this year have to start going right? Are, are we at that level? I, I, that's a, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Dublin are below par at the moment, mm. it seems. How close to par do they need to get and how much of an improvement is that for them to win the All-Ireland from this point? I think for this weekend, like they can be a, a little bit off last year's level and still win. But the reason why I'm giving Mayo a chance is that I think that they're actually a bit more than a little bit off last year's level. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people have seen that as well. Like is, th- is, isn't there a scenario though where Mayo also kick six balls into the goalkeeper's hands? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, like the... 
that, that can definitely happen. And when you don't have your talismanic forward there, that, that can absolutely happen. The, the one concern I would have for Mayo, it's actually on the Dublin side. So what, what we've seen, your, your boredom point is interesting because Dublin have strangulated Meath and Kildare for large swathes of the game over the last two games where they have conserved energy to a point and that they have realised that a game is done after 60-something minutes and, and just passed the ball around. They literally have not needed to go hell for leather for full 70 to 80 minutes in a game just yet. And they definitely have that. Like, I don't think there's any case we made at Dublin aren't as fit as they used to be. They, they can definitely get to that higher gear fitness-wise. And I just think that if they turn it on on that level, does everything else then just click into gear? And I fear it might. And I, and I fear that Mayo actually could be on the receiving end of of a bit of a backlash on, on that front. But I, it just comes back to this idea, what was what, what's motivating them to, to not have a massive 15-point lead, for example, or a 20-point lead going into that passing the ball around phase at the end of a game? during the Leinster Championship and I can't find an answer to that question Well maybe it's personnel you know uh, missing John Small missing Merchant and those players on their back that the team begins to feel a lot like an all Ireland winning team if, if this team started at the weekend but had a bench of Mannion and a few others obviously McCaffrey was never really a bench player but say you had Mannion and McCaffrey on the bench this weekend we wouldn't be talking like this at all No Like it's, it's the significance of those players or if Cluxton was playing it's, it's unlikely we would be talking about all this stuff so yeah. it's, uh, it, it feels like it's on a knife edge for the first time in a long time it does it does now like when you look through the papers this morning Philly McMahon's done uh, an interview saying that all of us must put our foot to the floor and like the, the comments that he's coming out with this week kind of are reminiscent of Dublin under Jim Gavin a little bit like I mean the, the Philly story last week was that he, he wasn't sure if he'd be around or not due to uh, his involvement with um, with Bose so uh, like that that was kind of a strange this isn't the very Dubs story whereas you're looking at his comments this morning and it's kind of a little bit of fighting talk or we're not paying attention to the noise and you're like those ring a bell from the, the the great Dublin team of the last few years, and that attitude is still in the camp without question. Yeah, except that you can you, you say these things, and then three years later, you're like, actually, we'd lost it at that point. It, it had gone a little bit because of all the players who'd gone, and the new management team came in, and they were finding their feet, and they were still building their own culture, as opposed to, you know, just inheriting the culture. Like the bit of them inheriting the culture is over, and it seems that we're in that now. This is Desi and his management teams group and it's it's going to be them over the next couple of years and you you know it's not automatic that it's the same as as previous and it shouldn't be the same as previous because that was Jim Gavin and his crew's way of doing business and it's unsustainable to take somebody else's and try and copy it so we're in that transition period and the Dubs are managing a transition period with an All-Ireland already in the back pocket like yeah and, and like the, the one other thing I'd say in terms of if you're looking for reasons to be hopeful for Dublin over these next two games there has been this narrative brought up from the dead again over the last couple of weeks about the dubs potentially being boring. And I get why it's said. I, I understand why people say that, given how some of the games are closed out. But it's not necessarily their fault as such. Dub, the dubs are incredibly boring to watch when they're playing Leinster football and when, they're, when they are passing the ball around and, and, when, and when they've killed games. Because the, the contest, as, as, an, as an unknown spectacle, is dead and is, by definition, boring. I, like, I don't know when Dublin have been in a tight game, when they've been right up against it, and the game hasn't been incredible. One of the all-time greats. Yeah, yeah, exactly, not just yeah, yeah. not boring, incredible. Yeah, yeah, the Mayo games are like literally some of the best examples of why Gaelic football is one of the best sports in the world when it's played properly. Ex exactly. And we've come through this period of dour defensive football, and we've come through it because the brain power and the talent of Dublin has shown that athleticism and a desire to attack intelligently mm. produces brilliant contests. So, so my point then is that we will see a completely different Dublin if they are pushed all the way at the weekend. In some people's eyes they will have gone from being boring to being 50% of one of the greatest games of all time if they are pushed because chances are that's what it will be. So that's an entirely different outlook on a team and, and an entirely different approach to the game potentially as well and, and if you're a Dublin fan I, I would definitely be clinging to that. Yeah, so look I, I think uh, is, I think there's a, there's a potential that this Mayo team, we're, we're overrating where this Mayo team are on the basis of, of what they've come through so far this year and that actually um, Goway played well for 15 minutes and, and Goway's identity is not set and Goway's best player got injured in an off the ball incident and had no real influence on the game after that and like fair play to Mayo, played brilliantly in that, at the start of that second half, it was, it was a blitz but it was a blitz, 
it wasn't their performance level so far in the championship over a number of years. And are they capable of doing that for the 80, 82 minutes or however long this game is going to last against the Dublin side? Or are they only capable yet because they're still finding their, their form a bit like the Cork Hurlers? That this is a, still, a, although you have some old players there, that it's still a new team and it's a young team and their identity is still being forged. I don't know the answer to that. And I guess we're going to find that out this weekend. But you'd be, you'd be worried. I, if I was a Mayo fan, I'd be very worried about Dublin just being too street smart for them this weekend. Yeah, and like that, that could be a, a situation where it's almost like last year's All Ireland final, which, what was it? Was it five points in the end? Which it just seems like a, a far smaller mar- margin than the game really was. You, you could see a similar type of game actually breaking out this weekend. Um, and, and yeah, like I, I do think that there is, there is still, like Mayo didn't necessarily reach their ceiling in some of those great games against Dublin. It, it might have seemed that they did, but like one of the constant criticisms of Mayo was how come they weren't seeing a great version of Aidan O'Shea in any of those games against Dublin. He's still there. He's of greater importance now that Killian O'Connor is not there. And if he all of a sudden has his best day out against Dublin, which would be an 8 out of 10, 7 out of, th- seven out of 10 even, then that's a, a, an additional element that they didn't have even during their great era when they were pushing the best Dublin team of all time um, to, to replays. So I, I think there are other things that you can point to and say Mayo have another gear to go to as well. But of course, the obvious thing is that Dublin are actually the ones that have been coasting along and, and are going to knock it up a couple of notches. Do Kerry need a game against Tyrone? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that this is generally the buy for Kerry would be... Uh, bad. First of all, if they win the All-Ireland, because people like you will say it was a soft All-Ireland for all time. But uh, second of all, I think that they will be soft themselves going into an All-Ireland, even though their A versus B games will undoubtedly be incredible at the moment, because I think their squad depth is, is outrageous. But uh, I, I think they need a game. I, I think that beating Tyrone in Croke Park is something that, uh, yes, they've done twice over the last few years, but it's something you can never get enough of. They are the Ulster champions. They've seen off some exceptional teams. And I don't think there's anything you can get in training that will replicate that match. And if they can't, my, my theory is that if they can't beat Tyrone, they just don't deserve to, to be up against the Mayo or Dublin in the final. I, I think that yeah. they, they lose that game fair and square. And no matter how many weeks it's delayed, I don't think anybody can have any complaints. No, I, and that I, finally we're in a scenario where you can say that about these games where actually they should be competitive. And, and uh, So the power rankings, just because to, to, we, we very quickly we went over these again. <laughs> number eight. Armagh. Number seven. Galway. Number six, Monaghan. Number five, Donegal. Number four, Tyrone. Number three, Mayo. Number two, Dublin. Number one, Kerry. How long has it been? I don't know. Ever? Ever, I think, since we've been doing these. But in the history of the power rankings, this has never happened. You're a bit blasé about this. This has never, this has never happened. I, like I, I, I guess it's, I'm not the only person saying this. You see, as I said, the bookmakers are all are all going with Kerry as their, as their number one. Kieran Whelan had Kerry as his number one in his power rankings last Friday in the Herald and the Independent. As, as you is, your, is your beef with Kieran Whelan over? Oh, it's just respect and respect only uh, myself and Kieran Whelan. Um, he, um, I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll be, I guess, setting the tone ahead of a Kerry Dublin final. Were that to be the final in a, in a few weeks' time and, uh, and, and saying that um, wouldn't Kerry be, the best team in the country. Wouldn't it be a bit ridiculous if Dublin were going for seven in a row and uh, and Kerry were the favourites? That would be like the, yeah. the, the 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 Kerry would have been out yared in that scenario. Well, that, that's <laughs> Dublin are going for a seven in a row and they're not all Ireland favourites. Maybe it's already happened. Maybe maybe Dublin have checkers and chess. Got, checkers got in rent free to all of Kerry's heads and the the whole transfer of yearism has has effectively been completed. Nine minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. We've got a packed show still to come. We've got the papers, a look ahead to Mayo against Dublin specifically. Colette Dormer, the Kilkenny Camogie player, and Eamon Dunphy is going to join us just after nine o'clock to talk about Roy Keane at 50. First, here's Richie McCormick giving Kelly Harrington's goal the OTB montage treatment. Enjoy. I'm kind of a, a strong-minded person, like so once I set my mind on anything, then, then I can achieve it, you know? She is a, a fantastic and amazing human being, first and foremost. She loves boxing. She must be the best. She is the best in the world at the moment. We can see her going to out to Tokyo and winning the gold medal. If all our stars are aligned, she, she's that special. I was going down the wrong pathway. Academically, not very smart, but streetwise, very smart. Boxing is very well known in the inner city. There's a boxing club on every second corner nearly, so... Uh, 
that was how I ended up getting into boxing and the discipline in boxing is the best discipline that you could have really Pillars of the arch So that when I left I'd always leave me mark Olympic final, gold medal on offer. Kelly Harrington, Beatriz Ferreira. Here we go. You never know like, when someone is born or when they're on the journey if they're going to be an Olympic champion. But I think when, when as soon as she got to the Olympics, I mean, I, I felt that this is it. Like, that's, that's our stage, you know what I mean? Wrapped in the curves of your Good shot. Lovely right again. Swing and a miss from Ferreira. Harrington boxing absolutely brilliantly in there. Can she persuade the judges? I still don't see myself as anything special because I'm, I'm not like I'm, I'm still do the same things all the time. Like uh, I haven't got superpowers or anything. Like I'm just a normal person, and it's great. You know, I love it, but I also love people being real and saying, "Yeah, you might be a world champion, but you still have to do this." You know, like you're still like you know you're you're no better than anyone else. Like you know, we're all we're all human. We're all equal. Like. Again, going to take a backward step. What a fight this is! Beautiful left. To be able to, to give my community, Dublin, Ireland, something to be excited about and look forward to, that's the real emotional part, you know, like, that means so much, like, to be able to make people smile and let them have something to be happy about, you know, there's not a lot to be happy about at the moment, so... This will hit people, hopefully. Last few seconds, Shirley Harrington has done enough in the lightweight final. Bang! There's the bell. What a performance. Akuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. She's done it! Olympic champion, Kelly Harrington. Goal for Harrington. Goal for the darling of Dublin. She's a hero, Kelly. Kelly. You're done it. And thank you, ladies, and all your good neighbours and friends. Three cheers for Kelly. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Joy, boy, don't be tense and say it with me here. I was breaking it. Have you subscribed to the OTB Rugby podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed in the last week. The way that officials and officiating is dealt with by the coaches. And I, I think the, the, these two teams have let down world rugby. There's no doubt about that. Subscribe now to the OTB Rugby podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts or get the entire OTB catalogue on the OTB Sports app. A seven time All Ireland winner. He's a Mayo legend. Now they're together on the same team. Join Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran for the hit of the GEA season. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. Nine months, you're a monk. If that goes well, well, then you have October, November, December, and you enjoy it, and you Lord Prince of, of Copperface Jacks. Get the hop on everyone else. Hear the Football Pod and more first on the OTB Sports app every Tuesday morning. For the latest on GAA, Olympics, rugby, football and more, download the OTB Sports app, turn on push notifications and hear it here first. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. OK, it's uh, 13 minutes past eight this morning here on OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy, Noel Sheehan with you every morning. You can get us on uh, OTB Sports Radio. Just say, Alexa, play OTB Sports Radio on TuneIn, and uh, she will. And hopefully she doesn't going to do that now on my phone. Hey, it's not going to work. Uh, and also you can get us on the OTB Sports app, which is free gratis and for nothing in the app stores. And uh, that's the best place to get OTB Sports Radio and all of our podcasts as well. So you can get us in many different ways. Uh, it, Roy Keane at 50 is kind of one of the main themes of the newspapers this morning. We'll start with otbsports.com, actually. Um, Tyrone doubts remain over a new semi-final date. We're uh, digging on this there today to see exactly what the likelihood is. I think a decision's going to be made at the weekend about whether or not they're going to be able to play the following weekend. So they've been uh, granted a six-day reprieve. They were looking for 14 days to get everybody out. Is Katie Taylor versus Kelly Harrington now inevitable? 
Uh, that was one of the questions they were asking on the show last night. Uh, Kelly Harrington told us she was thinking about turning pro in the middle of the pandemic, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen. Good news, Andy Robertson to miss weeks rather than months with ankle injury. And Brian Driscoll breaks down how the Lions fell short against the box. You can hear that around about half past nine this morning. Uh, so Roy Keane at 50 is the pullout in the star. The uh, mirror has a great story with Desi Baker. Uh, if I'm unshaven, don't look at me, don't talk to me. I'm just going to read you this bit. So Desi Baker, this is Mark McCadden has done this. Um, Desi Baker has uh, gone to Manchester United. He's... Um, uh, teenage sensation really for Ireland uh, he was part of that team that um, finished third in the World Cup in 1997 the Youth World Cup he's a uh, boot boy and he's shining Peter Schmeichel's boots uh, I had Roy I had Dennis Peter Schmeichel gigs he had five pairs of boots to clean every morning and Schmeichel calls him over uh, put, down, put down the boots Irish I look back and I went over to Schmeichel everybody was looking at me all the first team players was like oh my god he said something like, can I see my face in these boots? I was all panicky. I got all nervous. I don't know. Do them properly and get me some tea and toast. I was walking out of the changing room and Roy stands up. Excuse me, Desi, isn't it? Yeah, come here for a second. Here, his name is not Irish. It's fucking Desi. If you've got a problem with your boots, then tell him, don't be smart. What do you do if you're Desi? What do you do? You're standing there and you're like looking at Schmeichel. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm like, yeah, you're, what a hero. Yeah, 100%. Don't get him tea and toast. He'll get his own tea and toast. Like, I mean, I don't know. Is that, is that just the way dressing rooms were back then? Like, like I mean, we all know about the classic macho nature of behaviour, but that sort of thing, like that, that, sort of your piece of dirt in the bottom of my shoe sort of attitude from Schmeichel. Like, I mean... That was great work from Martin Cotton. I've never heard that yeah. story before. You oh, can nice. uh, you can read that today. That is class. And, and there, are, there are so many of those keen stories that have come out where we all know the, the villainous nature of Roy Keane, but there, there, are, there are moments of silver linings here and there, and the, the, there is... Like, especially in, during the punditry. In the star pullout as well. You forget sometimes that the mirror and the star are sharing their content now. Go on, sorry. It, like, especially like during his punditry career and stuff like that. I mean, there has been a lot written um, about about Keane over the last little while. And I, I know The Athletic did a kind of a piece speaking to a lot of people and, and Dave Jones was in the piece. And he kind of just like paints Keane as just a gent really around Sky Sports Studios that there is the, the on-air persona, which in his plan is obviously would have been the on-pitch persona. And then there was kind of the away from the pitch, away from the, the, the Sky Studio persona, which is which is quite different. And I appreciate the current day away from the lights keen is, is very different from the back of the day away from the lights keen because there are obviously some, some negative stories in that front as well. But I don't know, that, that's, a really, that's a really good um, anecdote, but it's poor from Schmeichel. But, you know, am I surprised? Am I surprised by Schmeichel? I am not surprised by Schmeichel. Daily Star, back page. I've hit the jackpot. It's uh, Jack Grealish. Uh, out to repay faith with Euro glory. He's already talking about winning the Champions League. They were only one goal short last season in Manchester City. Um, Jack Reed is not, not in any way worried about the transfer fee. I think he has not thought about that transfer fee more than once. It's like, pff, yeah, transfer fee, doesn't really matter. You, you know the way when they interview uh, losing Olympians after they've, they've come away from the games, that they're like, you're an Olympian, nobody can take that away from you. I, I would love if somebody went up to Jack Reed and was like, you're the most expensive British footballer in history, nobody can ever take that away from you. I think at that moment, it would probably sink in with him that there is this uh, tag that will be used more frequently if he doesn't hit the heights that he's expected to hit. Uh, Messi mania grips Paris. There's a picture of Leo Messi um, having his leg stretched there. Is that the actual medical or is it just a picture of a random medical? <laughs> I presume it's just a picture of a random medical, is it? I'm not sure because I, I didn't see it anywhere else so perhaps it is. Messi had a medical yesterday and is expected to fly in by private jet from Barcelona to sign the two-year deal and then they're going to not in any way tackly put him right in front of the uh, Eiffel Tower. <laughs> the Telegraph Sport has a, uh, I, I guess they must be a couple, golden couple fly home to ecstatic welcome. Uh, Great Britain Olympians Jason and Laura Kenny proudly show off their track cycling medals on their flight home yesterday. Are they, they are an item? Yeah. Yeah. Two golds and two silvers. Gold and silver each. Is that, is that what they ended up with? Uh, well, that's think, what they're holding in their hands. Yeah, you know, he's, um, he's their most decorated Olympian of all time now, isn't he? Uh, so, gap has narrowed, but Dublin still deserved a nod. 
is Kevin McStay's column in the Irish Times today and then Tyrone said they may not be able to fulfil a rearranged semi-final fixture. What a disaster it would be if there was no all Ireland football semi-final and maybe Tyrone are just putting pressure on to get the extra week. Maybe maybe it's the truth. Maybe it's exactly what they need to make sure that they actually are capable of fulfilling that fixture in a meaningful way. And we want that because the football championship really needs it. Um, great piece, just two quick paragraphs from uh, the McStay column. Mayo can forget about Kerry and Tyrone for the time being. Against Dublin, they've engaged in the theorem of losing. The more often you lose the same opponent, the closer you get to beating them. It's a dangerous game to play. Um, so he was out for a walk. You never go searching for perspective in Mayo in August. We walked the Kina Loop with the in-laws on Sunday. It's a beautiful walk, desolate and far away from everything under the shadow of Neffin. Croke Park seemed like a distant concern in that country. But back in Castlebar, you could see the colours in the polls and the local chat, the idle chat, was that they may have a chance of beating Dublin, but they've no chance of beating Dublin and Kerry in the one fortnight. <laughs> it's the old fatalism. Uh, that's what it's all about, though, isn't it? The, I know that there's kind of like an added layer of complication with Mayo. Uh, but, I mean, if you're, if you're not getting excited, then what, what's the point in, in winning anything? Code red hand. That's the tab of the morning for you this week, uh, this morning. Tyrone, COVID outbreak sees final delayed and Grealish proves a hit on his Eddie Hatt debut. And Lukaku, we haven't even talked about Lukaku, will be the most expensive star in history. Romelu Lukaku is last night on the verge of completing his £98 million pound sterling return to Chelsea, a deal that makes him the world's most expensive player. He'll be involved in transfers worth £291 million, which exceeds the £270 million spent on Neymar. Uh, so obviously uh, that involves the transfers from Everton and Chelsea and now from Inter back to Chelsea and to Manchester United uh, 100 million fee won't haunt me that's Grealish and Ali in line for England recall that's, uh, that's Moeen Ali that's cricket and that's the back of the uh, Guardian is them the English uh, the British um, Olympians coming back home Grealish finds the most expensive clothes to be a comfortable fit and I love being a 100 million pound man that's Jack Grealish now Jack wants Champs League. Red hands are tied. And uh, Nuno, my, my Kane City dilemma. It looks like they're going to pick Harry Kane for the weekend. Mm. It's like uh, he's isolating at the team hotel. Yeah, like the, it, I wonder what's going to happen there. Like, I mean, when Messi uh, it was not going to go to Manchester City, you thought, all right, well, Harry Kane is still very much on the cards here. But maybe it's just something that Manchester City just don't get done in time. That is the back pages this Tuesday morning. What about your own personal position? Every day the newspapers are saying he's worth £5 million. Real Madrid want to sign him. Blackburn want to sign him. Liverpool want to sign him. What is the position? Oh, the position is simple. I'm on a contract for another season and a half. And I've discussed a new contract at Forest. And, you know, if I get the right deal, I'm, I'm prepared to stay. Because, to me, this is the best club in England. And I have a lot to learn. And I don't think I'm learning any better place than on the playing club. Right. So it turns out the Dublin Mayo beef... Israel. Here's an exclusive first look at this week's football pod, which you can get exclusively on the OTB Sports app today. Did I say ex exclusive on the OTB Sports app? It is exclusive. Uh, here is Paddy Andrews saying that Dublin actually hate Mayo. Have a look. When you're in your 20s and you're playing inter county football, the only thing you care about is winning the All Ireland. Everything else is secondary. It's your dream is to win the Sam McGuire. For us with Dublin, that is from when you're a kid. How do I win the All Ireland this September? How do I go and kick scores on a Sunday in Crow Park? And sport, look, there's more important things in life than sport. We're finished now. We can kind of see that. But as players, when you're in it, there's not. And anyone standing in your way, our attitude with, with Dublin was, I'd actually, we probably did hate Mayo, or we thought it was hate at the time because we were looking at it. These guys are trying to take away our dreams of winning the All Ireland. And we knew for four or five years, if we were to get where we're going, we had to beat these guys. Like that question, were Mayo rivals? They were our biggest rivals. We felt Kerry, we had their number. We, we, the, their brilliant team had kind of come to the end. We knew for this four or five years, we have to get over these guys every single year. And we'd use anything to get an edge. I remember in, in 15, they were talking about that game earlier on, the first day, Keegan's on Dermo, and Dermo gets sent off and he's suspended. And he's going to miss the replay. And then the Sunday game that night, Philly McMahon is in a row with Aidan O'Shea and it's highlighted on the Sunday game. And it's like, Philly's going to be suspended for the replay as well. And our mentality that week was, and this is rightly or wrongly, but like we're creating this mentality, Mayo are diving. 
look at the bat, look at the tactics from Lee Keegan. How could he do that? And we're there, and we feel him with man doing the other and Mark and Aiden O'Shea, but we're like, how could they do that? The GAA are after us, the Sunday game are trying to show after us. That's that's your mentality. It's totally irrational. A lot of it is complete nonsense. Could you not see the woodpecker punches going in after the match and the replay and the videos? We weren't interested in that. We were looking at how do we get an edge playing Mayo? And you'd use anything. And it was just because you have so much respect. You had to be at your best. Uh, and that's, I, I see it now. I see it like you see Tyrone's attitude. You can see Tyrone or Humby. You see it in Kerry this year. They know you can, you said Tommy earlier in the pod and just stuck with me. Kerry look angry this year. They know they have to be on the edge to beat Dublin mm-hmm. and to win the All Ireland. And for us in our period, that was it. And every year we played Mayo. And, and Andy, Andy's right. He touched on it. The, the style of play both of those teams played, it was man to man. So, so if you play Tyrone, for an example, now, you'd probably, if you're a forward, you'd mark four or five different players in that whole game, just their style of play. Whereas with Dublin and Mayo, it was man-to-man. You had to win your battle. I, was, I remember, Mark, Colin Boyle for 75 minutes in an all Ireland final. And then next for every you're going up to Castlebar in the National League and you're marking Colin Boyle again. And Andy's marking Michael Fitzsimons. And Lee Keegan's marking Tom McConnell. All the Because the teams played that style, it was individual battles every single time you played. We played each other so often. This just kept building and building and building. And players had their own rivalries. The teams just played each other every single year. Final and third, semi-final 12, final 13, two semis and 15, two finals and 16, 17, 18. This just built years and years and years. And it did. It, like For us, I, I would say maybe we did hate now at, at the time because that's you had to just feel that edge. We had to be motivated because we just need so much respect. From now when you're out and you look back and go, it was just pure respect because... <laughs> It, that's what I look at Andy now. Andy, I'd say we didn't have one conversation over 10 years of playing against each other. Uh, honestly, it was just... Did you never away. talk? No, no, I don't want to talk to any of you. <laughs> we'll see you. We knew, I don't want to be friends with you because we're going to play in the all Ireland final next year. That, you just knew it was coming down the tracks. Whereas now, when you step out of it, I spoke with Andy for, what, 20 seconds for the first time. I was like, geez, Andy Barnes is a sound fucker. <laughs> <laughs> but of course he is we're all the same we're all just trying to win the all Ireland for your county but that's what I mean when you're in it you're totally irrational it's like I hate those guys <laughs> Tommy Rooney good morning to you morning lads how are we doing good stuff good stuff yeah it was a frosty episode this week I'll tell you that much we're getting to the truth of it now yeah yeah because it's uh, 14 weeks in like, Paddy has never admitted that before. Like, I've asked him about the concept of hatred on a football field. Do you know how you can prep for a, a game? And, like, it's an age-old thing in the GA that you hate the lads up the road or, do you know, the townies you're looking down on or whatever way you want to look at it. Nah, the dubs didn't fall into that trap. Now we just let the veil slip and we're seeing it all. That they've been having a chip on their shoulder and a siege mentality the whole way through to carry them through the six in a row. So, look, at it, it's, it just shows how powerful it can be to get something in your head and hold on to it. And how rational it is too. At the same oh time. yeah. But that... like the Jim McConnelly, Jim McConnelly getting off for the punches at the end of the game against Lee Keegan was one of the biggest stories of the last six, seven years. Dublin's lawyers were incredible in that uh, scramble before the All-Ireland final or the All-Ireland semi-final replay in 2015. Do you remember it? No? I, I'm, oh, yeah. the, 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 literally the night before the game. It, and then they didn't start him though. Did he come off the bench or did they start him? I think they started him, yeah. I think, I think they pretty sure they started him. Yeah, Paddy Andrews, they didn't need to start him. Paddy Andrews kicked five points that day. I don't know if you remember it, but it was an incredible performance in 2015. He kicked five points from play from ridiculous angles. Um, like, that was that was an insane game. Like, Mayo, Mayo, you, you remember the first game, Dublin were seven points up and Mayo came back. It was nearly a little bit like 06. They came back from seven points down with 10 minutes to go and they just couldn't get over the line. And then the replay, they're four points up after 53 minutes. And on 57 minutes, they're four points down. And that's just the way it went. So, uh, yeah, good fun this week watching back some of the games, talking to the lads about the rivalry. Um, they were just the games were just so close. They're all so good. And uh, there was needle. There was a bit of hatred. Turns out the Paddy Andrews had a voodoo doll of Conor Boyle at home. He used to put pins in it before each game. I might have made that up, but like it wasn't that far off. It he knew he'd be marking Colin Boyle, and there was a real bite there. Um, and we we had a bit of an ask me anything that was supposed to be twenty minutes, and it obviously lasted an hour. We had loads of questions in. Um, we got talking about 2017, the importance of Killian O'Connor, 
by Paddy Andrews and Shea Killian O'Connor's hand in the 2017 All Ireland final uh, warm up. You know the before the parade got the real story for the first time. Nah, he, he didn't mean it. It turns out, but uh, yeah, there was a couple. Don't of questions be giving, don't giving the stuff away. Make people download nah, the app. Good, no, it's a, it's a good story. Yeah, so it's um, it's all available on the OTB Sports app in about uh, an hour and a half's time. Whenever I get it uploaded. Oh, that sorry, I'm trying to remember now. That that year is the year that Mayo are completely written off because it's is that the Holmes and Canelli year? Twenty fifteen is that year, yeah. And yeah, uh yeah. Mayo played incredibly direct that year. They had no shooting for the forward line, and I can just remember seven or eight balls going over the end line. Um they were really good that year. They're really, really good. Just fell short. why didn't Mayo ever win one of those games, do you think? What was the main reason? Dublin were just so good. I don't know, like Mayo Mayo were the only ones that could get them, get Dublin into that. They really were the only like Kerry could did it did it in twenty nineteen, but Kerry didn't do it up to twenty nineteen. They didn't get Dublin into that space where the dubs were rattled. Like if you think of twenty sixteen, Dublin had two four before at halftime in that game, like in that first game. Two own goals and two points from Andrews who comes off the bench for a black card. Like Mayo had them absolutely rattled. It's so uh, is there, is there an answer for it? It's, it's, I don't know. Like, how did never? I don't know. When, when when we break it down, Andy talks a lot about 2012 and the Mayo Donegal Ireland final and that being the year, and that if Mayo got over the line that year, maybe they would have beaten Dublin then in another one. I'm pretty sure they would have. They would have had the experience of winning, whereas Dublin always had that experience of winning and going down the stretch in the last few minutes. Such fine lines, but they were always, it is. always awesome. It is really Such fine lines, though. It is really fine lines because when you think about it, the Dubs didn't have that, and then they required Cluxton to kick the free to win the game against Kerry in 2011. Like yeah. somebody has to do that, and and Mayo being maybe they're two players short, maybe they're two subs but short. Were, Andy you know? Moran was obviously had an awful knee injury at the start of August that year. He was the captain, the Mayo captain in 2012. He may not have been in footballer of the year form that year but he was incredibly important to Mayo it was nearly like losing Killian O'Connor I would argue at that at that age um, in terms of the influence he had on the team um, the other thing as well is is timing as well like Mayo had to beat possibly Dublin at their greatest and it was an incredibly good Mayo team I'd say a Mayo team that will win in All-Ireland this year and last year oh yeah but you know, if you were to put that Mayo team with <laughs> Boyle and Vaughan and Higgins and their pomp. And Parsons, it, yeah. And Parsons. And Shamey O'Shea. Like, the depth that they had was was good. Just, like, it's just short of being great. They're not, yeah. that, that's not their best player. Sorry, that's not their best players even. Go on. Yeah, no, it's, it's just, it's, it's such an interesting one. Like, it's such fine lines over the last 10 years. Well, it, um, it opens up that conversation again about where that Mayo team are in the pantheon of great teams. Because they mm. are undoubtedly a great team. Like one hundred percent. Do you rate them as highly as the Armagh team that won one All Ireland? Are they as good as that team? I mean, because Armagh get over the line, probably not. But like the way the way that they drove the greatest team of all time to be the greatest team of all time is very important and very interesting. Like it's it's like they were our rivals, and that's the greatest team of all time. We're all agreeing on that now, are we? That the Dublin team are the greatest team of all time. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I just had to check. I think, I think we are, but I, I think you're very right. Now I I don't know if. Imagine that hatred wasn't there. Imagine they didn't. They'd have stopped after three in a row and gone, "We're great," yeah. so, and they'd have, yeah. and they'd have gone and they'd have got white suits and, you know, they'd have been down in Arnott's getting fitted for blue suits and they'd have come out 100%. in blue suits before an All Ireland semi final and they'd have all gone on the piss and they'd have, you know, yeah. flexed the gold card and, and coppers too much and they would have been a completely different scenario. Yeah, and like Paddy talks about how even Jim Gavin tapped into it. And I was surprised by that. He tapped into that that siege mentality. You'll hear that in the podcast, I'm not giving that away. And he also talked about, we, we spoke about 06 in the middle of the hill, and I know we'll have Pillar and David Brady on tomorrow morning at OTB AM, but we had a couple of great stories about the middle of the hill. Andy was only young that year, um, and what the dressing room was like after McDonald kicked that winner. And Paddy actually admitted that Jim Gavin had then prepared. What if Mayo warm up in the hill? What are we going to do? So the dubs are ready if that ever happened. And what, were they going to mill at the hill if that's what uh, Mayo did? You'd be you'd be very surprised by the answer. All. That's the sell I'm going to give you. Can you just tell me? No, no. don't tell. <laughs> download download the OTP Sports app. I'm sure you have it already. But the podcast is going to be there in the football pod. And Paddy and Andy so going to be there it, shortly. Is is that history? Is that ancient history? Are those two teams 
are the teams now such different characters? Like, if 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 Philly's on the bench, I don't know if he's going to see any game time. I don't know if he's going to be on the bench. Are we guaranteed that he will be? Surely. Um, like, you know, so obviously Johnny Cooper is part of that. Mm. And well, Mick Fitzsimons is incredibly important. Yeah, but they're like I don't know. They're they're not players who are going to be having a row with Lee Keegan. Who's Lee Keegan going to have a fight with? Is another Camille like, to start a fight? Paddy Small. I, I, I don't think Lee Keegan. Like if you think of Lee Keegan, so Lee Keegan, the lads, like the argument was there. Lee Keegan is probably one of the, like probably the best player of that rivalry. Definitely Mayo's best player in that decade. Like one hundred percent, hands down. Like we know about Kenny O'Connor is important, but Lee Keegan, exceptional, and he went toe to toe. I don't think I think Lee Keegan could do that because he was at the height of his game in 15, 16, 17. I watched Lee Keegan man mark Shane Walsh in the Connacht final. It was a it was it was an odd call, you know. Yeah, he doesn't have the same pace just, anymore, and he, he doesn't he, like he's, he's had like Lee hip injury for for years that has has definitely slowed yeah. him a little bit. So, but so I'm not sure if, if Lee does he set the tone in a, in a that. in a physical confrontational way against somebody else. Like he he could potentially. Physically Maybe just match up. Costello. Well, he could do that. Yeah, I mean, could he go on Kieran Kilkenny? Does he have the engine for that? That's that's the thing. We we get into the matchups, and Andy Andy said he didn't call the Galway matchups right. So he, he's trying to get into James Horn's head, and he's he's not fully sure which way it's going to go. But we kind of we painted the we reckon the Dublin back six is going to is going to stay as it is in the fact that Merchant's going to be back. They reckon McMahon's going to keep his place. Probably going to push Howard up the field. So, ultimately, you're going to be leaving one of Paddy Small, Dean Rock, or Cormac Costello on the bench. Probably not going to be Cormac Costello. So, you imagine Paddy Small is going to be on the bench. So, then you're trying to match no. up the Mayo back. Paddy Small is starting this game. No, 100%. I don't think so, Jerry. Paddy Desi Small Farrell is needs to have a football on the bench. I, will, I, will, I, I bet you a fiver no, now. A fiver? No problem. I bet you a fiver no now that Paddy fiver. Small starts the game. And, sorry. And so, who, which Dublin player is on the bench then? I, more than likely it's going to be Dean Rock Paddy Small Paddy Small is has has got his head under Desi Farrell he is a Desi Farrell player it's Desi's team his culture is being set by Paddy Small he's one of his guys mm. Paddy's know, not a wing forward he's playing a wing forward well, I don't think it fully suits him and I think I think he's been playing well I think he's played well in the championship so far when they've, when they've needed someone to provide a bit of a spark and they believe in him Cor- Cormac Costello was given the spark actually Jerry he kicked four points four points to play the last day Rock definitely wasn't right the last day 100% but I don't think Rock gives you look at what Cork brought off the bench the last day the sheer pace the impact uh, like, uh, I think but they don't need, they need even off the bench, Tokyo. They, need, they need brains they need like game killer let's hire somebody to get on the ball and pass it and be part of the metronome the Dublin game is not about rapier pace uh, particularly <sighs> in the last 15 minutes of the match they, they want somebody who's going to come on, keep possession, calm things down, fix your boot, take a minute and 30 seconds over a, a free kick. Dean Rock, absolutely game sense and plays himself into the team. But I, I don't think it's at the expense of Party Small at all. So mm, you can pay yeah, me now, you can pay me Monday, whatever you want. On Saturday. I'll yeah, give you my Revolut, no problems. <laughs> um, anyways, the matchups you're right. Like, who is Lee Keegan taking? Who is Paddy Durkin taking? Who was Oshin Mullen taking? Like, Oshin Mullen had a very good game on Conor Callan in last year's All-Ireland final and Conor Callan, I think, was man of the match. Like, Mullen kicked a point or fisted a point early on. He won a kick out. His first point in championship, by the way. Like, Oshin Mullen and Paddy Durkin, same as Mayo were in the previous decade, that those two defenders are going to be incredibly important to Mayo in attack. So, are you going to tie them up with Conor Callan and Kieran Kilkenny? Or are you going to take a chance and are you going to give Stephen Cohen the job of taking Kilkenny? I don't know who's going to win. Andy Moran was incredibly passionate in episode 13. And then before we hit record the last day, I could just see the fear a little bit. And Paddy comes on. Paddy's brazen this week, lads. Paddy is Paddy's brazen this week. He's like he was at the end of the game against Mead when he roared in my face and Brian Duncan <laughs> at that point. <laughs> the anger is on. On episode 14 of the football pod of Paddy and Andy. Okay, okay. So we'll have to wait and find out exactly what's going to happen. Uh, you're not giving us your prediction, are you? No. Uh, no, I'm not giving my prediction. All because right. I feel like I'm, I'm caught up too much in emotion. I've seen Dublin in the flesh a few times this year. I've okay. seen Mayo in the flesh more. I Tuesday. just think that uh, 
Tune yeah. in on Friday morning for Quick Picks. Tommy, good stuff. Yes. The uh, 14th episode of the Football yeah. Pod with Paddy and Andy is now available exclusively on the OTB Sports app and you can get it wherever you get your podcast tomorrow uh, if you want to wait. But why would you wait? Go and get the OTB Sports app and uh, you can get that today because the anger is on. OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It is 8.40 this morning. Um, we have an update on the poll that we've been running this morning. Uh, we're paying tribute to Roy Keane and OTBM with Amy Dunphy and more on the way to mark his 50th birthday. What was Roy Keane's best ever performance? All the Man United fans, right? And they're wrong. Juve versus Manchester United, Turin 99. It was Ireland against the Netherlands is the correct answer here. You're all getting this wrong. 31% for that and uh, 10% for Ireland against Portugal, which actually is again underrated. It's gone back to being underrated. I think it's... I know that there was a lot of um, Ireland games re-shown on TV last year. and Maybe it's because we did a classic game club on Turin. Um, but I, I think that the people have got that right I think that's OK let's do classic game clubs on that campaign because that is uh, the best Ireland team I think that we ever had even better than the 88 team but uh, or the 90 team but maybe I'm wrong about that and I'm open to correction John Duggan good morning to you Jaron no, Owen how are you doing? How would you have voted in that poll? Oh Ireland Holland by, by, by far um, now I can understand why United fans would vote for the Juventus but as a uh, a neutral when it comes to club and United. Uh, it's all about context. The context is that we were unlikely to be going to that World Cup unless we beat Holland on the September the 1st, 2001. And Roy Keane uh, put in a magisterial masterclass of midfield play. Uh, there's an 11 minute, 27 second uh, clip on YouTube of just Roy Keane in that game. All oh, right. And it is uh, just breathtaking play, world class play, one of the best players in the world. And that was the game that got us to. Japan and Korea, a tournament he wouldn't play in. He started the move for the McIntyre goal. I don't know if people remember that or not. Um, people always talk about the Overmars thing, which set the tone. But it was more of the whole game, the, the way he played in the whole match, which was just breathtaking, really. And um, I wasn't there. I was there for his first ever game against Chile. I don't remember any of that. I was there for the final match against France. Um, I know you were there, I think, Chair. Yeah. You know, one. yeah. Um, and Lansdowne Road back then was... Uh, Amazing. Uh, Terrible, it, but amazing. It, 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 Terribly brilliant, yeah. It's just the, this uh, amphitheatre like no other. Uh, you, you really felt the IRC coming into it. And teams did not like playing there. And Holland ended up playing with 20 strikers. They were completely bamboozled. We had most of the second half to play with 10 men because Gary Kelly got sent off. And Roy Keane was just everywhere. He was uh, omnipotent. And it, he never, it was never the same again. Um, because Roy Keane, by the time he came back under Brian Kerr, was not the same player. But that was Roy Keane at his world-class uh, peak. So that would be my clear choice for uh, his best moment uh, as a footballer. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that um, whenever he was playing, you felt like you had the chance of winning, which meant that you could dream about anything happening, any potential outcome in international football. And it's going to be a long time before we have a player who is at that level again in international football. And uh, it's an amazing thing to have that belief in your own country's international team one of the regrets I have um, having come back from holidays is that I will never have got to see Lionel Messi play at his peak for Barcelona in the new camp against Real Madrid and it's something that's passed me by and something I should have organised 10 years ago and spent the two grand did, did what I need to do but a lot of us were looking up to see Roy Keane play at his best for Ireland um, in that whole campaign. Remember the Cyprus game away? He was, I remember just screaming at Gary Breen in that game. And um, the whole, he carried us to the World Cup, but it's such a tragedy they didn't play in it. Um, but once again, we all need to remember as well, he played in 94. He was our best player in 94. Yeah. Um, I know McGrath put in the best performance against Italy, but Roy Keane, probably the best player. I think he was voted as the he best was, player that yeah. year at the World Cup, you know, in 94, yeah. which, is, which is something that people always think he never played at the World Cup, but he did play in, in, in the States. Yeah, OK. Uh, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I think you make a very compelling case. I, like, I do think that, I mean, you can't blame the people who were voting for the Juventus performance, that's for sure, considering it was, I mean, in, in the hearts of Manchester United fans everywhere, just this, this unbelievable... Uh, individual showing, well, like an unbelievable moments from him um, w within a game that was so important and uh, kind of like dragging them to, to that final on his own at times, it seemed, in that game. It, it, it is kind of, it, well, it's beyond iconic at this point, but then again, so is the Netherlands performance. And 
Yeah, I guess from what you said there, it's a surprise that Turin is winning so healthily in that poll. I think there's uh, more Man United fans than there are Ireland fans at the moment, and they're feeling they're feeling themselves after the uh, transfer activity earlier on in the year. Let's wait and see how much they feel themselves in a couple of months' time. But anyway, what else is going on, JD? Well, happy birthday, Roy. Uh, 50th birthday today. Kelly Harrington, uh, one of our new heroes. Well, she was a hero before she won gold, but now she's a, she's a immortality. Isn't that really? She's not, probably going to be in an open-top bus to Portland Row. Um, not an official homecoming with the COVID restrictions, but great to see Kelly back. And uh, it's been such a heartwarming story over the last few days. And it's great that we have new heroes now. We've gold medal heroes like Kelly Harrington, Fenton McCarthy and Paula Donovan. And uh, I think that's really important for young people to be aspiring to to, to look at. Um, Soccer-wise, Romelu Lukaku set to go to Chelsea today. Ten years this month, he joined Chelsea from Anderlecht for £20 million. He's now going uh, there from Inter Milan for €115 million Euro after scoring 64 goals in 95 games for the Italians. Is this the missing piece in the jigsaw for Chelsea? Possibly. Because if Conte stays fit for the season, the massive chance of winning the title now. Um, is, there, I, I do. is there like a, just a, a moment where we, we criticise what Chelsea have done when they're, they could have had Lukaku, Mo Salah, Kevin De Bruyne and any of those other stars that they had on their books for this whole last decade and maybe they Jose were, Mourinho like, the, the, the common theme between all of those three or four Champions Leagues in that period if they'd had and kept those players who were all playing at their peak Jose Mourinho is the common link like Salah De Bruyne Lukaku they were all through his hands although he had ended up uh, rejoining Mourinho didn't he at Man United um, but yeah it's it's definitely Chelsea are such an unstable club, though that with managers, uh, with players, that who knows what would have happened. Um, but yeah, if they'd had a stable manager and a manager that was progressive, had they Pep Guardiola there for for years, then then maybe that might have happened. But yeah, they they, they are the Champions League winners at the moment. Are they winning the Premier League with Lukaku? I think he's the missing link. Um, how is it? front three or the front two going to look right now because you'd have to think he's a he's a nailed on starter going forward um michael obafemi set to move to blackburn rovers from southampton for seven million euro hasn't really got a look in at st mary's in recent times 21 years of age now rangers against malmo tonight in the champions league hoping to get to the playoff stage 2-1 down after the first leg andy robertson down for a few weeks now with an ankle ligament injury sergio guero out for 10 weeks with a calf problem so that hasn't got off the ground at Barcelona yet. And Tyrone, not fully certain if they're going to fulfil this game against Kerry at Krog Park on Saturday week. Chairman Mickey Kerr says they will not make a decision until the weekend after a large number of COVID cases, uh, close contacts, uh, up to 17 in the squad. The rearrangement of the game means that the All-Ireland Finals have been moved to Saturday, September the 4th. The same day the Republic of Ireland play Azerbaijan at 5 o'clock in Dublin. So generally, they've had Saturday finals at five. Yeah. So what are they going to do that day? I don't know. What do you think they should do? Um, I think they should play it at three o'clock. But generally, the GA don't really get um, uh, perturbed or distracted by what other organisations do. So I, 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 it could be the case you'd have these matches both going off at five o'clock. I think the Guardi will probably have a, a yeah an issue with two massive fixtures. Or, or maybe because of the reduced capacity, it's actually fine to have the two fixtures on at five o'clock. And so there's less stewarding required, there's less guards required for both fixtures. I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Um, I would generally feel that, like if Kerry, would, I would expect to be in the final, seven o'clock would not be fair for Kerry people. Um, so you'd have to think that would be a, an earlier afternoon match, like at 3.30 or 3 o'clock if, uh, if they don't want them at the same time. Having said that, what Owen, as our, our as our representative of Kerry, although you've been kicked out because you named Kerry number one in the power rankings today, how would you feel about a seven o'clock All Ireland football final against Dublin under lights in Crow Park? Be sensational, wouldn't it? On a Saturday night, It'd be brilliant. Um, I, I do think today tends to. I, I do think it is a consideration the uh, geography between one place and another. Usually, that three o'clock, three o'clock on a Sunday, half three on a Sunday is the traditional All Ireland final time. Nobody's ever made any qualms about that, so. I can't see why, why it wouldn't be the case on Saturday. I know a lot of people work Saturdays uh, more so than Sundays, and may, maybe that's an issue. Maybe. So is it better that it starts late and you can all go home possibly. afterwards? Yeah, like, po possibly. Is, is travelling home now more acceptable? Like You'd be home at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, half 1 well, in the morning after a 7 o'clock game. Uh, like, 
Um, Mick O'Dwyer would say in 1953 for the Armagh football final, they got the ghost train up to Dublin. So maybe they can get the ghost train back um, after losing the All-Ireland final to Dublin in 2021. I think if they win the All-Ireland, there won't be too many people worrying about what time they're driving down uh, or leaving Crow Park. But isn't it the whole thing with the, the Kerry folk and, and, and people who don't live in Dublin? They always just depart straight away, don't they? People don't really tend to hang around. And they've also played Dublin in the league multiple times at a 7 o'clock throw on haven't they? On a Saturday night, Saturday yeah. Saturday night, yeah. And there, there, would, there would be... No, there'd be 20,000 at that, 25,000 at that. Yeah, I, I think the one in early 2020, before the pandemic, I think that was, I think there was 50, 60,000 at that, was there, or maybe I'm over it. Definitely the, the league final that they had in 17, that was, that was close to uh, 60, 70. Was the league final not a, that was, an that afternoon? That was the day, but, yeah. but um, they have been known to get massive crowds in for league games. Um, so, like, it's, it's been done. I, I don't think it's the, I, I think avoiding the Azerbaijan game, I think, is is a, a bigger concern for the GEA than, than actually knowing what time Kerry people are going to get home or Tyrone people or Mayo people um, because they don't want to be going up against that. And this Sorry, were we, were we counting our chickens there by just blah, blah, blah and Kerry into the final? But you're, you're saying a 7 o'clock throne would be acceptable to your people? Yeah, it would be. It would be, definitely be acceptable to Tyrone and uh, it would probably be acceptable to, to certain parts of Mayo. Where, well. where will you get a pint at half one in the morning, Kerry? Well, I mean... Where wouldn't you get a pint, John? It's probably the best. <laughs> so we're in the All-Ireland. <laughs> have, uh, have you not been following uh, any Healy Rays on uh, Snapchat? Well, I was in Killarney on my holidays, one of my locations, and uh, I, didn't, I, like, I, I think it was well done by 9 o'clock, to be honest, lads. But, um, That's good. Don't... Yeah. Um, I, I thought you were going to grass somebody there, John. Oh, well, I was like, oh, give us some, give us some insider <laughs> information. All, all good. All right, John, good stuff. Thanks, all right, lads. Take care. Cheers. That's uh, John Duggan. Uh, welcome back from his holidays as well. It is 8.51. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit later on with Eamon Dunphy about Roy Keane at 50 and uh, a bit more as well. So if you want to get in touch this morning, 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can get us, uh, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We'll get through some of those in just a little while about your uh, Roy Keane thoughts as well. Now, uh, every year we're delighted to support allirelandcycle.ie. It is a charity fundraising event. It takes place this year between August the 12th and Sunday. Uh, so it starts on Thursday, this Thursday, August the 12th, and Sunday the 22nd. It's all to help raise vital funds for the National Breast Cancer Research Institute. It's a very brilliant cause. I can't overstate how much it is important that uh, the money for these goes to research institutes because they're the ones on the front line actually developing the science to help combat uh, the various cancers and this is for National Breast Cancer Research Institute. AllIrelandCycle.ie is the website and I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Kilkenny Camogie star Colette Dormer to talk about this. She's all part of the... Uh, it's an upcoming challenge that we're getting everybody out there for all ages and abilities. You can register and it's just to see how far you can go. So it's kind of a challenge against yourself. Colette, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, how are you? Yeah, Thanks good. for having me. Yeah, no worries. This this um, challenge, it's it's not to do a specific distance. It's not something that you can't do. It's literally how far can you go and it's a challenge against yourself and that's a great thing for anybody to get involved in. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, just about pushing yourself and see how far you can go and uh, kind of um, that's really it and kind of to test yourself and there's kind of an inter-county kind of competition going on as well and uh to kind of push every county to kind of drive on for their own county. I think Waterford won it last year, so uh, it might give the Kilkenny people a bit of a drive to try beat them this year. So hopefully we can get as many people out as possible between Thursday and Sunday. There's nothing like beating your neighbours. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, they have close border rivalry, yeah. Uh, come here, we wanted to talk to you a little bit, Claire, about what the challenge is like when uh, you guys have a target on your back as the defending champions. How different is it when you're preparing as champions because we, we automatically assume that it's going to be extra confidence and things come easier to the champions but maybe that's not always the case No um, sure as every team they like to be the underdogs when you're going into a match so uh, there probably is a little bit of added pressure in that but uh, all we can concentrate on is improving every week and improving our game like there's always aspects of your game that you can improve and uh um, get faster and, and uh, like you work on different tactics and stuff like that. So if you can just, we just have to concentrate on our own game and uh, go on from there. What changes in the aftermath of uh, an All Ireland win like that? Is it, the, the things you're talking about there are quite interesting. Is is there almost um, a, a very deliberate effort to to try and improve and to try and strive for even better, knowing that 
complacency is sometimes a threat for teams who, who do come out on top in the All-Ireland? Yeah, well, I think with Camogie, like, um, after the weekend there, the hurling is a little bit different. I think everyone's talking about Limerick going all the way, but with Camogie, it's so, so close. Like, anybody could win on any given day. So, um, I think it's just a, a matter of just improving and in, every day as we go out at training and working on different aspects, like any match you watch back, like there's always something to work on. And uh, yeah, it's just about getting better every game and hopefully on, on the day that you can uh, produce that. At this stage in the season, when you're getting into the business end, very much in the business end of the season, what are the improvements you're trying to make as a team? Um, yeah, like sure, it's just about speeding up and um, kind of working together and sure as everyone says your work rate that's like every team probably talks about work rate and improving that and like when you watch back the matches like the Waterford Limerick game like the work rate in the first 15 minutes was just phenomenal and so it's just about that and speeding up your game and uh, working together as a team. Can I, can I ask you on a personal level, why do you keep going? Why are you still, because is it 14 years you're playing senior in the county at this stage? Yeah, I think this is the 15th year now, but um, I, I don't feel like it's been 15 years. I honestly, like I thought last year was going to be it, like finish, like I wasn't going to go back in 2020. I was, due, I was to get married, I got married and then the way the COVID has fallen for me, it kind of has given me a, a new Lisa of um, joy with Camogie and kind of like a driving force again and it's given me a chance to just stay going. And it, I honestly don't feel like it's been that long. I feel like I've only stepped into the senior scene and only in the last couple of years. Like it's, it feels all so new and fresh and like you've new girls coming onto the panel every year and they bring a different aspect and, it's just, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. Just to explain that, will you? So the break, the break from the game actually gave you an opportunity to refresh your batteries or was it the fact that you realised that this isn't going to last forever? A bit of both, yeah. Kind of um, like the stepping away and training on your own. I know like some days it is a struggle to get out on your own and stuff like that, but you kind of, the onus was on yourself and... Uh, it kind of gave me a sense of um, confidence. Like once I was ticking the boxes, I was doing what I was told to do on my own. It gave me the confidence that I had the um, like a pre-season done before we went even back. And then last year we got to play club first and like it was absolutely the best year I've ever had in re that regard. So I really enjoyed club. You were able to be at training every night of the week with club. You were down with the girls and you had no added pressure that you were missing anything else. So you were able to give club full focus. And then once club was finished, then you were able to switch your mind and move on to county. And last year was really, really enjoyable. So it kind of um, just gave us another pep in the step, kind of like, and as you said, like it refocused me, it kind of realized that like Mogi isn't around forever like your career is very short we we there was definitely a period of about 10 years where all we heard about was the sacrifices that players made to play the game and it really sounded like there was no joy or energy behind it other than a, a gruel and a grind but actually it turns out that most people who play inter county really love the lifestyle really love being active and being out with their mates and challenging themselves and hitting new heights and doing personal best in the gym and all that kind of stuff and and maybe that's how we should have been talking about what that experience has been like yeah like people kind of seem to put a downer on all the stuff that you miss out but you you really don't like it gives you a huge opportunities like the last couple of years with the girls going on all-star trips like like you got to know other girls from different counties and you, you do like you do get the off season and you get to enjoy it and stuff like that and of course there is times where you can't go to this or that or do this holiday or go to this wedding or stay out late because you have to go home and you've training in the morning but I just, I just feel like when it comes down to it and you get so far and there's that win that one win that you're like yes this is all worth it and 
like you do get an awful buzz from it like so I, I don't think if you were to go back and ask any player at the end of their career would you change anything I don't think they would say yes it's, they would they regret any of it um, I think the only regrets anyone would ever have is that it didn't last long enough So you've no intention of hanging up the boots anytime soon it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm enjoying it at the moment. <laughs> so um we'll hopefully it'll go as long as as long as I can. And success obviously helps. Success does help. It it makes it easier, yes, yeah. Um, but it's the girls around you that, that makes it fun and enjoyable and the management like they just bring the crack to it and that's that's what it's all about, what sports about. Like you have to be enjoying it and like as Kelly Harrington said last week, like and her brother reiterated, like you have to find your passion and whatever sport it is or whatever you like to do, like you have to be enjoying it, yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. Can I this um uh charity is obviously something that it's 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 quite personal for you, I understand. Yeah, um so like mum was diagnosed back in 2007 but um not it wasn't breast cancer itself but I just feel that like any chance I can help in regards to promoting um cancer research or giving back to to any charity that has to do with cancer um I try my best um and with the All Ireland Cycle it's it's such a great charity like it's such a boost and promoting like exercises and it's not like a race. You don't have to like beat anybody. It's just you, you go out and do it for yourself. And uh, I just find with something like this, like even if you're not the person that is going through the journey of cancer, um, for you, someone that's uh, like linked to it, family or friends that has someone that is going through it, it is a way of for us to be able to give something back and to help. Um, I just find when you're on the sidelines and you're watching someone go through it, like you just don't know what to do and you don't know where you can help or do anything. But uh, the likes of the All Ireland Cycle gives you a chance to do something and feel like you c- you're offering something back. And to give people support in a, in a way that, uh, however small it may seem, can hopefully give them something to feed off. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Listen, Colette, we wish you the very best with the rest of the summer, however long it lasts. And thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks a million, guys. Thank That's, you. Uh, Kilkenny Camogie player Colette Dormer talking to us. And just to remind everybody, allirelandcycle.ie. It starts this Thursday and it goes until the following Sunday. And the challenge, as Colette said there, it's not a race. It's just to see how far you can cycle in 10 days. And then obviously there is this inter- inter-county rivalry where if you register on the website and you uh, put your place in, then obviously they can... Uh, uh, find out which counties are doing best so that is the story with that and my thanks to Colette for helping to promote that this morning allirelandcycle.ie is the website right we're talking Roy Keane next with Eamon Dunphy here's a small taste of his 2019 OTB Roadshow appearance alongside Gary Neville if you've not seen it then you're one of the few people on this planet who hasn't but you need to get onto YouTube and check it out the half hour of his match at United Exit is worth a rewatch have a look We've got to wrap this up, unfortunately. We've been way over time. We're well, going well, to give away a... story. Is it worth it, Roy? Well, Maddie about... Taylor? <laughs> th- let me do that Maddie Taylor story. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> you set me up for a fall, yeah. <laughs> this probably won't good. be as funny here as it was on the flight this morning. Um, up at Sunderland, blah, blah, blah. Trying to get players up to Sunderland, always difficult. Their wives didn't want to go up there because they want to go shopping. They did it. Eventually get Matty Taylor up. He was leaving, I think, Portsmouth. And he, he did an opportunity, I think, to go to Sunderland or Bolton. So I met him at the, uh, the stadium, up at the boardroom, gave him all the, the talk for about an hour or two. He said, I've got a lot to think about. It's a big decision. I said, of course, you take your time. Huge decision. I'll walk you down to the car park. As we walked down, he says, listen, Roy, huge decision. Thanks for the chat. He says, yeah, you take your time. Big decision. I understand for your family. No problem. Bolton, Sunderland to Bolton is no comparison, but listen, Bolton, we're not a bad team at the time. I see him walking to his car. He says, listen, brilliant. Thanks for coming up. I'm literally, he turned his back. I got a text. <laughs> text? There's not many people texting me. So I says, uh, hi, Roy, it's Maddie Taylor. So, all right. <laughs> I've got, I've got my phone. I think it was a Blackberry at the time they were in, and I went, uh, <laughs> I can see him getting in his car. 
<laughs> I've, uh, I've decided to go to Bolton. <laughs> I'm waving, I'm going out to car park. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. We all talk about what might happen and our hopes and dreams for the day, but that's not real life. Dadcast Tuesdays from 3 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in on the OTB Sports app. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's five minutes past nine this morning. Roy Keane turns 50 today and it has uh, caused massive outpouring of content right across Ireland and indeed the UK. The Athletic had a huge special yesterday. There's a pullout in the Star today and there's features in all of the newspapers too about it. I'm delighted to say we're joined by one of the best people in the world we could speak to this morning to try and put some context on Roy Keane at 50. Eamon Dunphy, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, I'm fine. Um, before I get into Keane's place in the pantheon of Irish sports people and what his legacy is, I did want to ask you, who was easier to work with, Roy Keane or Bono? Um, I didn't have any problem with either of them working with them. Um, Bono was fine um, and Roy Keane uh, was very good to work with uh, and I was, uh, as you know, some fallout for him from the book. Um, and during that, uh, when he took a heavy hit uh, financially and uh, missing games uh, because of something in the book, he was fine. So I didn't have any problem at all uh, with them while I was working with both of them. Was there similarities in terms of the, the characteristic that drove them both to greatness? Well, I think uh, both of them were intelligent. Um, both of them were funny in private, uh, um, and in both cases, and I don't say this to uh, be conceited, but in both cases, they asked, asked me if I'd write their book, so they wanted me to do it. So they were very cooperative, uh, and I had no uh, problem really uh, with either of them. And these are, like in the case of you two, it was their first um, autobiography or biography and in the case of Keane also it was a first so these can be difficult and there can be disputes or uh, misunderstandings but in both cases uh, it was perfect they were very very good to work with Isn't it interesting that we as Ireland and I'm talking Ireland here have a complicated relationship with both you two and Roy Keane Well yeah I, I mean I could speak to the Roy Keane um, uh, controversy, if you like, or they say various things about him. But in, on a personal level, I found him to be very decent, very funny, um, very normal. Uh, he's five lovely children, his wife and his home, very welcoming. You could tell they were a very happy family. Um, and there was nothing uh, to um, dislike about Keane. He's a very charming fellow. When he wants to be charming, uh, when he trusts you, um, he's very charming and very funny. Um, I think there's two sides to his character, obviously, and there is a side of him that's cruel, harsh, illogical, uh, and still very passionate. Uh, he's a he's a kind of split personality, really. I'd have to say that. It's interesting that you mentioned that he's he, he's kind and charming when he when he wants to be. Well, what do you think then? You're saying it's a split personality. What do you think is is more of his natural state? Do Do you think that the charming side of him comes more naturally to him than the confrontational pundit even that we see today? 
Well, I think they both come naturally to him, if that makes sense. I mean, you can go, when you walk into someone's home, there's five children there, um, you can tell there's a vibe in house. And I used to go there to do our interviews preparing for the book. Uh, and it just felt very comfortable. He was very loving and comfortable with his children, very respectful of his wife. Uh, he invited me to stay for lunch, which I didn't want to do because I wanted to keep a little bit of distance uh, for objectivity's sake. Um, so I think, the, you know, Roy Keane, before he settled down, before he had children, he was wild. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble. He, When he wasn't uh, working, uh, he was a big drinker. Uh, he was a wild, uh, not in a bad way, in a kind of laddish way. He had been a kind of a wild man off the field as well, uh, but he completely reformed himself. He didn't drink any longer. Um, he knew for his football and for his family, this was something he had to do, and he did it. He didn't talk publicly about it, but he stopped drinking, and he changed the things in his life that were causing him trouble, uh, and he showed great resolution and resolve in doing that. And that, again, uh, I think testifies to his strength of character and his discipline, and it's admirable. I mean, he could have gone the other way, Roy. Uh, and if you go back, you probably perhaps too young to remember it, but when he started out, when he'd come home in the summer and go to Cork, uh, around Manchester, Alex Ferguson, he spent a night in a police cell. Ferguson had to come in the morning and get him out. Um, so all that kind of stuff uh, was around him, but he changed, and he deserves enormous credit for that. In a way, what's happened with the TV stuff and the social media stuff is that it's it's a little bit cartoonish in in some aspects. Um, you know, yeah. it's like uh, Roy's angry, and it's Ian Wright laughing beside him, or it's Mika Richards laughing beside him. But actually, that story, that origin story of the young kid from Mayfield who writes off to all of the clubs and is rejected because of his size and is rejected by the FAI because of his size until eventually he gets discovered on a field in Fairview, I think. Um, yeah. Even when the team gets hammered, he stands out as a, as a 14 or 15-year-old. And that's the start of the breakthrough. That bit of the story has kind of been squashed a little bit in, in, the, in the cartoonish later years where he's just become a a parody as a manager and now is is a football pundit almost exclusively for whatever reason we we maybe that's just maybe that's just life Eamon, I don't know no i think his struggles were real um he's very cork and cork people are different they see themselves as different uh, and uh, they have what you might call a superiority complex but they they're all uh, many of them very funny um they, they think Dublin is against them. They think they see themselves as outsiders. And very much a part of Roy's formative experience was, I don't think he was picked for the Irish schoolboy team or the Irish youth teams. Uh, he felt he should have been. Uh, he did a false course, uh, which, you know, was really tough. Uh, he had a long, hard journey to even get uh, to North Forest. Um, and one scout who picked him out, not one of the big, a scout for one of the big clubs. I mean, Forest were not a big club and they certainly didn't have a big presence in Ireland. No one went to sleep at night dreaming of playing for Notts Forest, but that's where he went. Um, and he then had, you know, Brian Clough was the person who really um, um, made him, uh, encouraged him, believed in him, believing in him was a huge, uh, Clough's belief in him was uh, a transformative experience. That's what made Roy Keane, because he was small. Uh, and in, in a way, uh, that, that part of his life um, has disappeared, uh, melted almost like snow. But it was a very, very important and formative uh, few years um, between, say, the age of 14, and 20. Where does he stand in in the order of our greatest footballers? 
oh, there's, I don't think, you know, I, I think when you start uh, trying to say, say Messi's better than Ronaldo or Ronaldo's better than Messi, all that stuff, great players are incomparable, all in their own way. Uh, he stands uh, in the pantheon of the greatest players ever to have played uh, football anywhere. He was a very, very great player. I suppose one way of describing it as just an observer and a fan even, um, it's not possible to say Roy Keane was the best player ever to play for Manchester United or indeed in the world. What it is possible to say is there was no one you'd rather have on your team if you were a player or in your club if you were a fan. He was a great player and he'd be the first name on any team sheet and that would include a team with Messi and Ronaldo, Bobby Charlton and other great players. He was a very, very great player. He brought in intelligence to the to the battlefield, uh, a determination. He was an inspirational figure for the players around him. Uh, and that ranges from Eric Cantona to Paul Scholes to David Beckham to Peter Schmeichel. Uh, he was a very, very, very great warrior. But a warrior who knew he wasn't the headless chicken. He was assessing every moment in a game. Uh, he could affect the tempo of a game if he felt it needed to be ratcheted up. He'd ratchet it up. He'd make a tackle. If he felt it needed to be calmed down, he'd calm it down, slow the play down. He read the game brilliantly. Oh, he was awesome. I mean, and also for Ireland as well in, in, in many instances. When we played Holland in Lansdowne Road and needed to win to qualify for the World Cup, uh, in the first minute of that game, he clattered Mark Overmars just to send the message to the to the Dutch: "This is what you're going. That's what this is where you are, baby, and it's going to be hard." And in the end, I think Jason McIntyre scored the winning goal. But Roy Keane led that, and he he did it quite cold bloodedly from the first minute. He's a great, great player. I don't think anyone who ever saw him play could forget. I mean, there's a cup final against Liverpool where, which, where Canton has scored the winner. But Roy King was absolutely awesome that day. Awesome. From this remove, how do you feel about what happened in Saipan now? Yeah, it's... A, it's I still feel the situation was mismanaged. The trigger or the catalyst for the whole thing, uh, at least when they got to Saipan, was a, an interview to Roy King gave to Tom Humphreys in the Irish Times. When I read the interview uh, in the morning, I thought he was pointing out that this was a very unsuitable place uh, to prepare for the World Cup. Uh, he talked about the lack of facilities. Um, he didn't agree with that. I think he complained that they had to go to a social event uh, where there was drink and journalists, uh, which isn't really a big deal, but he thought it was a big deal. On That's on the island of Saipan. Uh, he, But I know before he ever embarked on that journey, he, he arrived uh, to the hotel, Dublin Airport Hotel, the night before they were due to leave. And it was the, our last uh, interview for the book. And I was there. And he he, arri he arrived in a very bad mood. He had a serious hip injury that had troubled him for months. It was threatening his career, in fact. And Niall Quinn's testimonial a fortnight earlier um, had been played. And Roy couldn't play in it because he wasn't fit to play. But the newspaper headlines were Keen snubs charity. And it, you know, Quinn was allegedly giving some of the money to charity. Now, he was raging about that. He'd been, he, as he saw it, he'd been stitched up. So even before he got to the hotel, that night he was simmering with rage before he ever got on the plane. 
and there was nothing you could do with facilities. He had a row with a couple of Irish journalists on the plane. He was in very, very bad form. Uh, and when he's in bad form, uh, you know, he's, he's dangerous. But he had a reason to be. He had actually been stitched up. Uh, now, a more mature person would have just, you know, said stuff happens, but he didn't. So we actually embarked on that journey in bad form. And then everything that he saw in Saipan um, made things worse. But I didn't think the interview with Tom Humphreys, to get back to the core point, was anything outrageous. He didn't lash out. It was quite considered. It was no big deal. Now, Mick McCarthy then called a meeting brandishing the Irish Times in his hand. And that's the infamous meeting where Keane said all the things he said. I think make sure to just let that pass. I'm certain Jack Charlton would have let it pass uh, and anybody, really any coach would have wanted to let it pass. It, there was no need to provoke a row. There was certainly no need to call a meeting of the team, brandishing the paper and to uh, try to force Keane to apologize. That was ridiculous. So he was mismanaged at that level. And that they, these are contexts that are hugely important. That's where the fuse uh, that caused the explosion was lit. So I, th and I also think he would have stayed, um, but I think the final call was made, as I understand it, by McCarthy, who wouldn't um, back down. It's and I think... I just to go on to say that when you consider how well we did in that World Cup, how well we played, add Roy King to the mix and we could have got to the semi final or the final. When South Korea got to the semi final. And the German team obviously reached the final and they were no great shakes that we obviously drew with. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is is, is Keane's hip injury something that we probably don't talk about enough? Was was he fit? Yes. Is that is that the the, the reason so Obviously, he, he he gets accused of snubbing the charity, which is huge, and I understand that that causes that's it. Totally untrue. But is is the injury actually the thing that's pissing him off the most? Because he feels he's not going to yes. be able to perform at his level. I think he, it's annoying him because he is playing and has played for United for about eighteen months when he wasn't really fit. I think he'd been taking injections. I think he'd been really trying to almost hide it to continue competing, ignoring it uh, and get getting through it. So that injury was absolutely critical. And it came into play again when he left United. You know, he talked about playing when he was broken, when his body was broken. Uh, and when you consider the way he played, it's not surprising his body was broken. But the injury was uh, a very significant part of the story because a warrior like Keane needs to be super fit. And he knew he wasn't super fit. And that leaves you very vulnerable psychologically behind the facade. Psychologically, it does leave you very vulnerable. Um, and I felt, I felt, I feel, I know, I think, that he went to Saipan in that state. Why do you think there's such division still about that because when, when maybe maybe the facts are still disputed in some people's minds but when you lay it out like yeah. that like I, I actually I have some sympathy I, I have more sympathy now than I did at the time for McCarthy for the way he mishandled it I, I understand a little bit more why he did it because that's his character and he in some way was trapped by his own character which was I have to be the yeah. man here and I'm trying to be the alpha dog as opposed to like yeah. seeing that there is an alpha dog whose job it is to, to lead the team and you should just you, you need to work with that um, he, he tried to be Ferguson when he couldn't actually be Ferguson uh, but there's not universal acclaim or love for Roy Keane from the Irish football public at the moment is that is that to do with the, the, the time with Martin O'Neill or is it still a hangover from Saipan uh, it's difficult to, to know for sure I mean it, it, I think um 
for a lot of people, he let us down uh, in Saipan by, you know, coming home and causing trouble. He's seen as the, as the troublemaker. Um, so, I mean, there was a split. I mean, John Giles and Liam Brady and myself fell out for about 15 minutes in a big way over, over it. So people were um, divided, uh, but not everybody knew the whole story. Not everyone had the, the real context for it, which goes back to the Quinn testimonial uh, and to other slights. Um, and in that sense, Keane can be very volatile. Um, I, well, he remains a, a very volatile character. But um, I think his time in coaching um, and management has not been... Well, that's not what, what Roy Keane is, really. He is not good at that side of things. Um, he really has... He doesn't have empathy, should we say. <laughs> I mean, in the clip that you played earlier, I heard you play, I think, um, he's talking about when he's at Sunderland. Matty Taylor, and, yeah. Yeah, and he's saying the wives don't want to move to Sunderland. I remember the quote, uh, because the shops are no good, they'd rather be in Manchester or down south or somewhere else. And uh, there was a, a, an element of truth in that, perhaps. But the irrationality of it was that Roy's family never moved to Sunderland. That he never moved to Sunderland. He used to come up on a Tuesday. So the thing he was bemoaning in players and their families, he was actually doing himself. Well, that's the great irony, isn't it? The the, the row yeah. with the Ireland team and with Johnny Walters is essentially get out there and train. Yeah. And Johnny's like, I can't train anymore because my body won't let me do yeah. it. And it's like, well, that's exactly what you were going through. And you're yeah. kind of accusing him here of not faking injury, but certainly having it up a little bit. And it's like, you can't do that. Yeah. That's that's the that's the red rag that caused the whole problem yeah. in the first place. Yes, I, I mean, to fall out with John Waters over or accusing him of feigning an injury is almost, so it's surreal. I mean, John Walters is a fantastic professional uh, and a really good guy. And Harry Arthur was with him as well. And in fact, Declan Rice witnessed that. And Declan Rice is one of the best players in the world now and he's playing for England. But <laughs> unfortunately, that's true. It uh, is, we, yeah. And and Jack Grealish could have been on the bench for Martin O'Neill when, when Keane was yeah. there and Keane was at Villa the whole yeah. time too. It's like, it's it's mad it's mad the, the, the kind of Forrest Gump aspect of Irish football that Keane is there from 1994 in, and our best player in that World Cup all the way up to Grealish and Rice ending up not playing here. It's like there's few yeah. figures, maybe maybe Giles and Keane have had the influence on Irish football. That's it. Yes, yes it is. I mean, they're, they're both, uh, they were both great players. I mean, really, really great players. They could play anywhere. I mean, Keane could have played for any uh, club in the world at any time in the world and Giles uh, also but Giles was a much more stable um, character uh, and in many ways um, you know they're different people yeah. entirely um, and there is a side of Keane that is totally irrational ir irrational um, and I've spoken to a number of players uh, Irish players who played for him at Sunderland at Ipswich um, and he was brutal, like tough, and, and completely wrong. He, that's not the way to manage people. He, coaching and management, I, I just think he's not good at. Um, he was a great player, and he is, in many ways, a very fine man. He does things for the guide dogs. I know from my own researches, he will ring up terminally ill children and give them a call because the parents had asked for it. He does an awful lot of good uh, in private. He doesn't seek publicity um, for things. There's a, there's a lot more good about Roy Keane than there is uh, bad. But what is bad is rough. I mean, he, he's been... He, 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 I got on very well with him. Um, we did the book. Uh, and then I went back to my day job as 
you know, uh, writing analysis and commentary for the Irish Daily Star. And then I, when he was at Sunderland and he did really well, I, I remember having a conversation with John Giles when he went to Sunderland, his first job. And we were both really excited because if this guy could transfer his leadership qualities um, to management, uh, then there would be a new and important uh, figure in the game. Well, we were really excited, but it, it fell apart for reasons we've touched on. Um, and then I didn't say much for a while, but for some reason, one week we had cause to be critical of him um, about his management of Sunderland. And I got a phone call from uh, the late Michael Kennedy, who was his solicitor and agent. And he said, what's going on? Oh, what are you talking about, Michael? He said, well, we thought you were our friend. I said, well, I'm a journalist as well, Michael. You know, I have to do my job. And at, at that point, uh, I was on the enemy list. Um, so uh, he would, you know, that's the way he is. What, what did you say? I said, look, I'm a journalist. You didn't buy me. You only leased me. Uh, and <laughs> I had to go back to work, lads. I mean, what, what uh, had you said to incur the wrath? I criticised, perhaps, uh, the way... I, he started very well at Sunderland. Mm. And then they it sort of... It dipped in a big way. And then there were rumours of fights and stuff like that. And somewhere along the line, I did a piece. And I think it might have been to do with players' wives not wanting to go to Sunderland. <laughs> <laughs> or coaches wives not wanting to go to Sunderland um, whatever it was I don't know but it wasn't a very big thing I mean it wasn't an attack it was just a criticism as part of you know your work but I it, was a, it reveals a kind of um, should we say a naive misunderstanding of what journalists do and a really thin skin oh very yeah I think yeah, that was better. the other, like, and in a way that made him great. The thin skin, everybody was against him as a kid, that drove him on. Yeah. But the thin skin never kind of disappeared. It, it seems, at no. a, at, at, certainly when he was in management. The, the thing about the punditry is really interesting because you talked in private, he's very funny. He was hilarious the yeah. night of our road show. Like, yes. perfect comic timing. Really amazing comic yeah. timing that isn't yeah. just like funny for a footballer. It was like legitimately funny. And yeah. I mean, I don't know where his punditry is going to go. I kind of enjoy it because I can. Oh yeah, no, I think he's, I think he's very good. He, he's certainly not afraid to call it uh, as he sees it. Uh, he's not afraid to be critical of Manchester United and its players. I think he has, obviously, a good uh, relationship and some considerable respect for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, which may be a thing that will conflict him at times. But he is. Um, he he's box office. I mean, if you're watching the Euros, that's where you go. Um, and if you saw him, see him and Graham Sinness on a Sunday afternoon on Sky, you know, uh, you're going to get intelligent, direct commentary, and it's very very good. Um, not deep in Roy's case. Uh, he wouldn't be doing analysis with uh, pens and hold it there and all of that stuff. But on the big picture stuff. He's very blunt. He's very good, um, and uh, he certainly will be a major asset to ITV or Sky or whoever are employing him. And his knowledge of the game is good. Do you think he's resigned to the possibility that he won't be a top level manager again? Um, I don't know that he is entirely because so many great things have happened in Roy's career in football and the, the almost miraculous journey he made you know from Cove to <clears throat> Old Trafford and then all the things they won uh, and that kind of gives you a belief in a way that the impossible is doable and that somebody will come along from a big club or a club with potential and offer him the job I don't think that will happen I think there's a general understanding in football, <clears throat> mainly emanating from players, that he's he's not good to work for, 
uh, and he's trouble, and he's trouble for everybody. So I don't think he'll get it. Uh, a big job. I think he may be harbors. I saw a quote from him a couple of months ago uh, in which he said there might be one more go in management or I might get one more opportunity in management. Uh, I don't know if he will. Um, and all the evidence we have from Sunderland, from Ireland and indeed from uh, Ipswich is that he's not very he doesn't have the empathy, he, he, he doesn't, he's not rational. I mean, having a fight with John Walters, and it was a long fight because John was at Ipswich with him. Yeah. <laughs> John Walters is a, he's just one of the great guys. He's brave as a lion. He would no more feign injury. But I saw John Walters on the Late Late Show talking about it and how hurtful he had been to John. And that's a side of Roy that... Um, is unfortunate. I I mean I I admire him and I agree with you about the humor. It's very cock, I must say, but he's bloody funny. And he spots your a fake uh real quick. Uh and he spots, you know, things and he's a very engaging and charming um fella. I we I used to have a television show for 15 weeks and we got Roy uh to come on the show. And he was staying in the Marion, and we were doing the show in the Helix. And there was a member of our team, a girl, very nice uh, woman, young woman. And somebody had to go into the Marion and uh, pick him up and make sure everything was good. So she sa I said to her, would you do that? That's your job for tonight. I said, no, I hate him. I hate him. No, I'm not going near him. So I said, look. It's your job. You have. You can't not do it. So go on. So she went in the limo uh, to the Marion, and she came. They, they arrived back at the Helix, and it it gives you an idea of how his charisma. And he was so handsome and so sort of almost beautiful and charismatic and smiling. And she got out. She got back into the Helix into the dressing room. I said, "Where well, are you gonna?" Oh my God, Eamon, he's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and he charmed her and <laughs> she said, can I take him back? <laughs> but it was a, a completely uh, funny moment where the villain that she had in her mind, this thug, uh, turns out to be charming, considerate, polite, respectful, and all of that. And of course, extremely good looking as well. It was just a, a, a very strange sort of um, example of how perception uh, can be misleading. Yeah, I, I remember the interview really well. You'd uh, you'd Alistair Campbell on that night as well, I think, and I remember... Yeah, we did, yeah. Seeing... I think Bob Geldof as well. What a show that was. Uh, I remember seeing the two of them meeting in the in the green room and uh, and bonding over the fact that neither of them was drinking. Although, I, I, I don't know, if memory serves, Alistair Campbell might have had a small whiskey. Uh... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> they went back to the Marion, actually. We went back with them. They were both uh, drinking tea. Right. Very good. Uh, the the look. This is completely off the point here, but um, the falling out you had with John Giles was when you were presenting the last word on Today FM. Is that right? In, yeah, yeah. In two thousand and two. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for having that brief fifteen minute fallout because as a result, Gilesy joined us here on Off the Ball and it's been a mainstay ever since. So all's well that ends well. It is. Yeah, John's a great, uh, great man, uh, and there is nobody on earth with as much knowledge and understanding of a football game um, so you couldn't have a better guest he's he's just amazing and remains amazing and on the podcast I do stand uh, people just love his commentary um, and they respect him so much you know John is a is a, a a gift to the world it was a wild time to be starting a, a nightly sports radio show and I remember too that you were very generous with your time across that period when, you know, all sorts of stuff was going on. Everybody was a little bit tired yeah. and emotional at stages. Yes. Well, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> Eamon, great stuff. Thanks a million. Oh, have you got one? Other? Sorry, Eamon, I just have one more question before I let you go. Sorry. Uh, just yeah, because we've been speaking so much about Roy Keane uh, as a pundit and you spoke about your relationship there and 
I often wonder that Roy Keane as a footballer and before he gets into punditry, was there a quiet, I guess, appreciation for your punditry work from Roy Keane? Like, I would suspect that Roy Keane will get an amazing kick out of the Rod Little line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was. I mean, they asked me, uh, Michael Kennedy they and Roy asked me to write his book, which was a real compliment. I think we, he, he liked the way I didn't prostrate myself in front of Jack because Roy had uh, tough things to say about Jack. Um, and he, I think he liked my stuff um, and he didn't see me. Maybe he saw me as an old footballer in, in need of a dig out. But he, he, the fact that he chose me to do it, I, can, I regard as a compliment and um, a, a very nice compliment, really. Did Roy make money on the book or did he lose money on the book yes. after the fine? I, yeah, he made a lot of money. I mean, the book is the second biggest hardback seller in, in Britain um, ever. Wow. Uh, well, it, it was published directly after Saipan. Right. And he made plenty. Seven figures, I think. Okay, so the fine was like, ah, look, yeah, it, was, it was probably... No, the fine was, the fine, the fine was substantial. <laughs> but it, I know the book made a million for him. Right. Uh, and... Um, you know, he kind of, and to be fair, he was captain of Manchester United and the book was really a story of the journey. Uh, I mean, Rodney Doyle um, went, uh, encountered Roy at a very different time when Roy had burnt his uh, bridges with United and, you know, could say the things he couldn't say um, to me uh, and for, for publications. So, um, yeah, I was lucky. I, I, wouldn't normally do uh, a book like that, but I did, and I'm, I've no regrets about it. And I have huge admiration for him. Uh, I'm afraid it's not mutual, but I have a uh, great time for him. I'd say he's softened at this stage. Eamon, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. <laughs> My pleasure. That's uh, Eamon Dunphy, as I said, their host of the Stand podcast. Uh, right, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, um, you could talk all day about that. It, it, there are so many different fascinating angles to it, and so much stuff that even though you know the story or you so you think the story you think you know the story there's so many different things you forget about the story and all these different elements at play and i don't know i was kind of like yeah if you asked me like a week ago uh, are you interested in hearing more about saipan i think most people are like absolutely not and then this morning i'm like actually this is uh, really interesting and i'm absolutely happy delighted we went back into it the um this this the the route he had that the route that Dunphy and Giles had and us being able to sign Giles was massive. So like, talk to us, talk to us about that. What a, important. And I remember all the meetings around the time, like, because uh, Newstalk was just on the air. Newstalk had gone on the air in April and they obviously have their falling out. I don't think the falling out is in the middle of the World Cup. I think it's a little bit after. I think I think that I'd need to go back and, and check exactly when John joined. But uh, at that stage, Today FM was owned by a separate uh, company to Newstalk. So we were absolute rivals. And... Hook was doing the evening drive time show, but the the only show in town was Dunphy on the last word. It was like an absolute sensation. And of course, everybody knew that he was writing Roy Keane's book and Saipan happened. So every night people were tuning in to see what was going on with him. And then the falling out happened. And I, I don't think the falling out was like Mick versus Roy. I think it was about a specific, I think it narrowed down to something much smaller than that. Look, we, we should get them both on at some point and, and, uh, and, and go into the, the details of it. Um, but they both stood their ground and John decided he, he didn't want to work on the last word anymore and was available and we were like, wow, <laughs> let's go. So he did um, he did an hour with us on Thursday nights and he would do Mondays and Fridays on uh, the right hook. And, um, and that's the way it was. And that was it. And, and was there a sense from Giles at that point that he, w- he the friendship was done, and that this was. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't think it was that long before because they would have been in the in the TV panel mm. again, so they would have been forced to work together. And I think you know, I don't know when the rapprochement happened. Fifteen minutes, as Eamon says, it could have been six months. It could have been not much longer. But by that stage, um, he joined us, and we had a contract, and he stayed with us forever. You've got Thursday Night Football with John Giles. It's, um, it's incredible. And was there a sense at all from him that he was like, God, Emma's not going to be happy about this now? That, that, that sort of guilt that anybody would have? I think footballers are really different. They're like, contracts are important and yeah. 
you know, the, the deal is the deal. So, um, yeah, a very, very interesting time to live through in retrospect. Uh, and I, I distinctly remember being, um, uh, so our producer at the time, Dara Whelan, uh, his partner was working on the Friday night show that Dunphy had. And I remember how amazing it was for us to be able to be backstage when Keen was going out and doing his interview and coming back and like uh, how this was, I, I think it was about six months after Saipan. It would have been in the winter. October, November would have been the time Dunphy had that show, I think, and that would have been in 2002 as well. So uh, Keen arrived in, like whip it skinny, shirt and jeans, very relaxed, did the interview and then was, you know, uh, can't be having one of those talking about the booze and we were like, oh. But uh, yeah, they were, that was a, a a wild time in Irish media. Anyway, that's that. 9.45. We've gone way over this morning. If you want to get in touch, uh, we'd love to hear from you. 0879 Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. Uh, OTB Gold, Keen at 50 Special. That's the Keen and Neville Roadshow. Dadcast at 3. Mount Rushmore, Cork. Couldn't be anything else other than that today. OTB Gold is Barry Ryan's The Ascent and Off the Ball is live on air and online tonight on the OTB Sports app. OTBM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We'll be back tomorrow at half seven with Keith Wood, David Brady and Paul Caffrey. A big Premier League preview and much more. We'll leave you this morning with some Brian O'Driscoll talking the Lions. Yeah, you're welcome along. So uh, history doesn't repeat itself and all that. It most certainly rhymes. A 2-1 series win for South Africa in Cape Town. 19 points to 16 on Saturday. 37-year-old Mornay Stain uh, picking right up where 25-year-old Mornay left off. Brian O'Driscoll is with us. Evening. Hi, Joe. I do have that memory. I think it was on again for the billion time that uh, test where Mona Stein kicks it in 09, the winning kick, and you, uh, with a slightly pained expression, are watching the flight of the ball. The camera picks you up on the bench, I suspect with a headache as well. And uh, much like in 09, I didn't really think he was going to miss on Saturday. Yeah, listen, that's what he was brought on for, wasn't it? His um, yeah, World Cup winning out half. Um, Pollard was having a, an off day with the tee, missed his previous couple. Um, he did slot, maybe he did slot Cheslin Colby's um, try, but he'd missed a couple of penalties. And it's one thing that you can almost guarantee with Mornay. He's nerves of steel um, and he's been there before. And there was a reason that he brought him back in. You know, the, they usually go 6 2 on the bench and they played um, Willemse as the backup out half in the second test. But they just felt as though this one was going to be tighter and they might need a secondary um, goal kicker and how right Jack Niederber and, and Razzle Erasmus were because clutch, uh, clutch kick at a crucial time and 12 years on, yeah, history does repeat itself. Mm. So from a Lions perspective then, this was a very winnable game on Saturday. Oh, completely winnable. You know, they should have been not necessarily out of sight in the first half, but with a comprehensive lead. Um, you know, they... As soon as Finn Russell came on, it was all them. Uh, it was the first time we've seen the box on the back foot. Their defensive line speed was struggling. They were at uh, the speed of the recycling because um, the collision winning started getting favouring the, the Lions. And so it just had a negative impact on, on that suffocating box defence. Um, and Finn Russell was playing aggressively to the line. They know that he's a threat himself. Um, but he was using you know, runners inside and out, fizzing passes across the faces of some of his would-be uh, ball carriers to outside backs. And it was just, it was lovely to see. Um, and, but unfortunately, and, and you hear ex-pros talking about it the whole time, the, the, the differences between winning and losing at this level, and it's taking your opportunities. And it came down to that again. And there were a few. It's not as though it was one chance. There were two clear-cut clear cut try-scoring opportunities that should have been tries that went to begging. Um, and one from both bad decisions, but one, you know, Liam Williams doesn't need anyone to tell him that, he, you know, mm. he's got, he can't throw that dummy. That's Josh Adams in for a definite five-pointer, probably a seven-pointer. And then Tom Curry with that line-out drive where he, he changes his bind and tries to take out Sia Khaleesi when he doesn't have to. No. It looks as though... No. It looks as though the Lions are, are going to rumble over there again. They've got the momentum. So if you look at that, on the half hour, that's where the Josh Adams no try happened. That's 17-3. Mm. And so how much of that, say, first 40, first 50 even minutes 
was down to Finn Russell and how much of it was down to things like suddenly winning a little bit of the, you know, the at, at the gain line with ball carrying? Because I suspect, you know, that's massively important too. And Dan Bigger's probably thinking, geez, if I had, you know, a, a team winning a few more gain line collisions, I would have looked a bit better than I have maybe as well. So how much of it was down to Russell, this different lines that we saw? Well, I think in reality, okay, it, it was the it was the Finn Russell game plan. It didn't wasn't like the the brand that the Lions had played for the two games and ten minutes before he came onto the field. Okay, so um, it was it was almost that he tore up that um, playbook and went with what what he plays and, and what he plays is heads up rugby. What he sees in front of him, he's a space player. He's an instinctive player, and. Yes, he has the occasional um, mishap that can be very costly, but more often than not, he creates lots of space for himself and for those around him. And he has defences sitting on their heels. And that's the first thing that you got to do against the spring boxes, make them question themselves defensively. And they started doing that. So I think you have to be honest about it and say that whether Dan Bigger was following protocol and, and playing to a certain game plan Finn Russell came in and, and decided that's not going to work and so something needs changing and I'm going to play the way I always play and it's flat on the line and with the ability to make decisions in hundreds of a second and that's what differentiates him from himself from most other tens in the world is the ability to instinctively play what he sees yes. irrespective of what play has been called. So Russell comes on, it's my party, get with the programme or... I don't know, you know, tough luck. And and it's interesting as well that, I, and I presume this happens with any kind of playmaker in most sports as well, to be honest, you're probably that bit more inclined to make certain runs off a playmaker than you might be if you have a sense, well, look, my more steady Eddie's just going to kick the ball here. Well, I, I think it's a huge amount is to do with the depth that they take. You see, saw how flat Finn was. And that is the way to take on a, a rush defense it's not get back in the pocket it's actually trying to get as flat as possible and it, it kind of it goes against your natural instinct because you want more time on the ball but the whole thing is from a rush point of view is they want to be able to number up exactly who has who and as soon as you take it flatter and you start running across a little bit and there's runners inside and out it just puts an uncertainty into who the personnel you know you're meant to be marking up are and, and that's what he did brilliantly. He did also have his wingers very busy coming off the shoulder. We saw uh, Courtney Laws once or twice popping up on his, on his inside and his outside. So I do think that as soon as the lads saw him come on, they thought this isn't going to be like it's been previously. I don't think Finn is capable of playing that previous game plan that we have been playing over, over the last two test matches. We're going to play his way. And when you see him taking that flat, well, you've got to get flat with him because your first support player, if he does get caught in in uh, in a collision, you've got to be there to you know, clear rough ball, make sure you secure it. But there's a great chance you know with him that he's going to get offloads away behind back, you know, the backs of tackles. Mm. Um, he's going to throw the 50-50s. He's going to have that little chip and chase. So you've got to get there with him if you want to actually get involved in the game. Yeah. So it, I think it, it's probably it's a natural progression when you see the personnel coming in. And God, and they look so much better for it. I mean, I think everybody was saying, why has it taken two test matches and 12 minutes for us to see this approach from the lines? Especially when, if you looked at the way Gatland had been talking in advance of the series, and if you looked at some of the players he had picked, where he said that, you know, he wanted an emphasis on mobility. Why we hadn't seen it for so long is, I think, the massive regret anyone involved with the lines will have on their very long flights home now. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it will be um, a big regret because... We did. It didn't have an awful lot of competition, but that third test, the, the brand that they played, was considerably better than anything. Even in the victory in the first test, it wasn't good rugby. You know, it was ground out rugby. Whereas that was entertaining rugby. It was stretching, um, stretching them around the rook, but also stretching them out wide. They got, got them on the edges a couple of times when a little bit better passing. They could have been. They could have made more inroads. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, everyone seemed a bit busier. You know, the wingers seemed to get an awful lot more touches. They were anonymous. The wingers in the first two games. How many touches did Watson get? How many touches did Hogg get? Um, Van der Merwe. You know, even though I, you know the jury for me is still out on him. At least he was busy though, looking for work and trying to carry ball. And um, you know, he, he to me he comes across as more of a running back than a rugby player. 
You know, he, he's destructive. You know what he's going to do when he gets it. He's not going to pass it. He might offload it. Um, but big physical teams will be able to match that. It's probably lesser teams that might struggle against him, but the, the box didn't. And I think that's why he couldn't impose himself on them because they were able to match mm. their physicality. They're used to guys of his size coming at them. And so Russell has been injured for the last month, really, so he couldn't have played in Test 1 or 2. Is it that just bigger isn't capable of of playing that kind of game, or he would need, you know the coaching staff would really need to you know drill it into him? You have to play this kind of game. Did they have another option they could have used if it wasn't Russell to try and play a bit more rugby? Bigger can play a, a more expansive game. Of course he can. He can. He does for Wales. Has done um, for Northampton. He likes you know he can mix his game up really well. I don't think he plays as flat to the line as Finn Russell does, but not many do. Um, but the feeling is you've got to remember rewind back a month before Finn got injured it was all bigger it was going to mm. Finn was you know was was in outside of Scotland was one of the lucky ones to maybe it was, you know he got into this touring party probably he did deserve it in my opinion he probably deserved it but ultimately you know he wasn't he wasn't a, a shoe in whereas Dan Bigger was and Dan Bigger was going to be starting the test match it was about Dan Bigger or own Farrell at 10, not yeah, Finn yeah. Russell, really. I suppose, I suppose what I'm getting at, though, is so Bigger is capable of that kind of rugby. And I take your point on Russell. I mean, very few people were advocating in advance of the third test, geez, let's um, take out Bigger and start Finn Russell, who hasn't played in a month. I mean, it was very hard to foresee how well he'd play. But on Bigger, so he's capable of playing uh, a better, a better uh, game plan. And like it takes Russell to come off the bench and show, like, God, if we play this way, it's much better. So you kind of think between the coaching staff and ben- between the senior players... How was it across the first two tests that they produced what they produced? And and that, you know, I, I don't quite understand that then. If, if bigger isn't the reason or the answer to that, then they've no real excuse for going as conservatively as they did. But they won the first test show. Yeah. You know, they won the first test playing that way. So they thought that they could limp across the line playing, get, maybe do the same again. Yes. Yeah. And they got their comeuppance in the second test in the second half. And then... The penny dropped. It was like we can't do that again in the third. Now they've got our number. We've mm. got to change things up. And I don't know. We'll never know whether things would have changed up dramatically with Dan Bigger. It didn't look as though they were going to in the first ten minutes. Um, but the fact that we got Finn Russell coming on that was that was the only way that we could guarantee that things were definitely going to change up because I don't know if he knows how to play any other way. Yeah, he can't kick the ball away. It's just it's not in him. And I think he'd prefer to go down fighting than than to you know, kind of capitulate on game plan. I Listen, he's had arguments in the past with, with uh, Gregor Townsend. They've kind of butted heads and he's you know, stepped out of the Scottish setup for a while, um, differing opinions and so on. So, um, I, you know, he's obviously um, hardwired in a particular way to, to play a brand that's very hard to break away from. And um, it suits him down to the ground in Racing Metro because he's got, you know, these phenomenal players to play off him and play heads up. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it was it was lovely to watch. Mm. I, I love watching Finn Russell, but I do always worry a little bit. And he was great. And his goal kick, I was thrilled for him that his goal kicking was excellent. His game management was really good. Um, I know the Gats picked up at the end that you know he made an error, um, which kind of which which led to the pe- to the penalty that morning. Stain um, knocked over, but. For me, you know, Finn Russell made that third test and it's a it's a crying shame that the Lions couldn't actually get it done with all of their territory and all of the stats favoured in, in on on their side that somehow the box still found a way to get it done. Yeah. So possession and territory, they had sixty three percent, they doubled the number of carries, three times the number of defenders beaten, they had six clean breaks to two, they had eight offloads to four, I think they had six in the first half alone. Really the only stat they lost on was the penalty count which they lost 15 to 12 and that's yeah. not insignificant but it, it boils down to your point again about taking chances like when Am and LaRue get that chance to set Colby away their execution is near perfect as opposed to yeah. those lines chances you mentioned to go 17-3 up yeah and there's like if you look at the, those there's a couple of really brilliant skills in that um, you know th- how much breaking ball did we see South Africa get on those on, on kick contest way way more than 50 percent 60 65 70 percent over the course of the three games i would say it's definitely something that they practice but also instinctively it feels as though they're ready to react to you know and uh a, a catch that isn't caught clean um 
But Am's ability to read the situation really quickly, sidestep, pulls price in and then offloads immediately. He sees that ahead of time. He's like a snooker player a couple of shots out that he knows exactly where to create the space. He's, you know, people will say, maybe you should have shifted immediately. He knew he had the physicality to get beyond the tackle and get the offload away. And he was a, a very aware as to who was around him. And I thought that was brilliant. Billy LaRue, who I think for me is one of the weaker links in that South African team, but yet a brilliant, brilliant piece of skill in um, in um, the way he drew Jack Conan and um, you know, ran on his inside shoulder, wasn't, didn't allow him to push in any shape or form out to Colby. Not that I'm sure Jack Conan would have loved pushing out onto Colby anyway, um, but he drew him magnificently. And then unenviable task for, for Liam Williams to come across. And the, your main goal as full back there is don't get smoked on the outside. And we know about Colby's hitch kick and acceleration, but we also know about that step back on the inside. And, and you kind of hope when you're a full back that you'll get enough of a shot for mm. the cavalry to come and, and clean it up. But he didn't get enough of an impact. And Luke Cowan Dickey didn't... Um, you know, didn't get to him, didn't have the wheels to get to him. So it was a brilliant, brilliantly executed try. But um, but the Lions had their, their opportunities themselves as well. Like I, I went through the game in a bit more depth today. And like with with only a few minutes to go, Van der Merva had a brilliant opportunity to, it was granted it was down the five meter channel to draw Stain and, and put B- Bundiaki in. And even in commentary, not much was made of it. Um, but he he did not he, at no point did he even consider it as an option, and I think that's what you get. You get some guys that are pure athletes, and you get some guys that are pure footballers, mm. and it's the amalgamation of the two is where you get the really great rugby players. But yeah. um, for me, th- there was yeah, there was definitely other missed opportunities besides the ones in the first half. Yeah, fair enough. One last point on the game then, and then we'll go bigger picture. How did the turning down of points? situation age I, I guess you know the <laughs> the blessing and the curse in some ways was that the first time they did they score try and so they stuck with that policy yeah and and so you'll be vilified if that doesn't turn into a try you're turning down points I, I, I was always a believer as a captain of taking the point taking points that are offered to you and you know we've talked on the show before about how a lot of the time you want your out half to come up and demand the ball to knock it over. It's almost as if your your decision is made for you. And you can, of, of course, overrule them if you really feel the energy out there or you feel as though your your pack leader comes over, Paul O'Connell will come over and say, we want this in the corner. We've got them on the rack on the line-out drive. You go, okay, grand. That's, that's, that's why you have a group of leaders together. So you're 10, you're the pack leader, you as a captain – um, maybe an influential back, you know, depending, get together. And um, and they felt as though they had them on the mall, and they, and, and they did early on. Um, so when you have success, it's very hard to then feel as though you take a backward step and go, oh, we'll only take the three when there's five or seven on offer. Again, you feel as though, and, and if you think about it, even with the, like they should have gotten over for a second mall try with, with the Tom Curry uh, penalty. Mm. So um, I, I can understand why they did, but... You know, test match rugby is about just edging in front and three points sometimes is invaluable as it turned out to be. So yeah. I'm kind of torn on it. I, I think teams, modern teams go to the corner an awful lot more than I ever would have as a captain because I understand the magnitude of, ha- of, of having a good goal kicker, a confident goal kicker and keeping that scoreboard nudging when your momentum is in your favour. Mm. And if you don't come away with points when momentum's in your favour, you'll be made pay. For the listeners, certainly like the selection, you know, the end up with Elliot Daly at centre, for instance, in your first test match was off and you've got the likes of Slade and Ringrose sitting at home. So certainly selection, if that's, you know, the biggest thing a Lions coach can do, he got that badly wrong, was certainly one of the points Matt made. I think there was a few errors of judgment in the selection process, for sure. Um, I think that is an obvious one for me. Um, Henry Slade um, was um, was a majorly missed opportunity because of the different components to his game that would have been well suited to playing against South African opposition. Um, and I said that last week, so yeah. I won't labour that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but um, well, you can always listen retrospectively. You can always say, um, you know, you you know, the personnel of. Okay, it was unlucky not to have Win Jones, you know, involved early on. Even though 
you know, he had a bit of a mixed game. Um, Simmons at eight looked pretty energetic when he came on for his 10 or 15 minute cameo in test three, even though Jack Conan went well, would, you know, would he have brought a different explosiveness that maybe the lions were missing? Um, you wonder about Ben Young's, you know, taking himself out of the equation. Could he have brought something that maybe was missing at halfback as well? So there's, there's factors for and against, um, in when you come to a selection process, um, I think the big one for me is 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 in some of the outside backs. I think Van der Merwe isn't a test a Lions test uh, winger, in my opinion. Um, he was busy and and, is, and was hungry, but I, I think he's lacking something in 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 you know in rugby know how department to really exceed at the very highest level. And yet he's um, the only one they stuck with. Like he was the mainstay. And I, I I just couldn't understand that. It felt that really felt as though there was a real nudge from Gregor Townsend in that regard. And I thought we did see his influence um, over the course of um, of the tour and. Yeah, you know, before the Scottish get on and say stop with the Scottish bashing, I thought obviously Finn was great and and Watson was probably a bit hard done by not seeing more game time than his fifteen or twenty minutes in the first test, mm. um, and Sutherland was not you know played well. So you know they're improving, but there's no way that um, that you know some of the personnel um, would have played as much game time. I don't think if Gregor Townsend wasn't a, a big yeah. pusher in those selection meetings. Could- OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved.